Hey there folks, this is Richard. Before we get started, I just wanted to remind y'all that since this is episode 198, that episode 200 is approaching rather quickly. You guys are programming episode 200. The hosts of Hello, This is the Doom Show, which is Brad, Jeffrey, Simon, and myself, we are not programming the show. That's your job. So, doomedmoviethon at gmail.com. That's the email. You can record an MP3 with your questions, your comments, your shout out, whatever you want to say. Uh, top 10 lists are good. If you just have a list of movies and you want to get our quick opinions on them, or not so quick opinions, opinions on them, then uh, doomedmoviethon at gmail.com. If you don't want to record your voice, uh, you just want to send an email to the aforementioned email address, go for it, and we'll read your email on the air, uh, especially if it's a romantic confession to uh, Freddy Krueger. So that's enough from me. Let's hear about uh, good old Simon and I talking about Nightmare on Elm Street's part four through six, because that's what we did for like three hours. <laughs> That's called acting. Bye, guys. A bad guy never knows he's a bad guy. Iago doesn't think he's the bad guy, you know. And Freddy doesn't think he's the bad guy. Freddy's got a beef. You know, these parents scarred me. You know, this is his beef. And I'm gonna get their kids for that. I got off fair and square. Those lawyers got me off, and Freddy's got this legit beef. The interesting thing that's happening now, I think really uh, as a result of uh, films like Nightmare on Elm Street, is that we're getting into what I have coined as rubber reality, which is films that deal with the way that reality can be distorted and permeated, uh, going into dream states, into in states of madness, and, uh, all sorts of strange illusions. Fred Krueger! Now if you know who that is, you better tell me, because he's after me now! What do I do for Father's Day? I send a card to a hundred maniacs. <laughs> I'm killing myself here. <laughs> Freddy Krueger is every girl's dream and every girl's nightmare. Freddy is the ultimate nightmare. Freddy rocks. Like Freddy is like addicting and you you know it gets better and better each one. It's the scariest movie I've ever seen in a long time. I, I don't think I'll sleep tonight. Every town has an Elm Street. Hey, Effie. No running in the hallway. Halo, and welcome to Halo, this is the Dom. Shazha. I am Richard, and I'm here with Simon. Hi, Sim. Yeah, Yo, wow, wow, wow. I was going to try and do some kind of backward speak thing, then I realized I got like the phone names, just I didn't know what I was doing, it just ended up slowed down. You don't want to go to the Black Lodge with the Tall Man or Pumpkinhead, no. and you don't want to uh, end up in the Matrix with Jason Voorhees. On Sunday, with Robert De Niro, with the long fingernail from that movie with Mickey Rourke and Pinhead, Hellraiser. What's your pleasure, sir? <laughs> Hello and welcome to Hello, This is the Doom Show. I am Richard. I'm still really joined by Simon. Uh, just about, I think. Not uh, because of you, I think it's more because of me at this point. It's like, what? Oh, yeah. I'm just really glad I didn't call you Jeffrey like that one time. <laughs> I you? felt so bad. We were <laughs> literally talking shit about Jeffrey, and I was like, Jeffrey has the biggest thighs. OMG, he looks so bad in those tank tops and no <laughs> pants. And you were like, LOL, BRB, brother. <laughs> and then I called you Jeffrey. Uh, ladies and gentlemen. Jeffrey's thighs are not overly big. <laughs> I have to clear this up, okay? Oh, doctor. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'd forgot about that. Maybe, maybe, I, maybe I repressed it. And uh, yeah, it's probably a good thing that um, you can't like slap people over Skype or anything. So I was rather, I was rather hurt by that. Good. Well. <laughs> I'm helping you build character, and you're like, I got plenty of character. Just like this movie's got plenty of characters. 
Yeah. Whew. All right. We are continuing our beautiful uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, a.k.a. Final Destination. <laughs> <laughs> I hope people appreciate my sense of humor when mm. I'm like, hey, what's something we'd never cover on this show? And you're like, I have no idea. What are you talking about? And I was like, well, I can't stand those Final Destination movies. Mm. So I started hyping that that's what we were doing with Little Freddy Clues. Little Freddy Clues. And now everyone hates my guts. Or my or my butts. My multiple butts. Freddy Kluger. Mm. Good night. Uh, so we're, <laughs> on this episode, we're going to talk about uh, Nightmare on Elm Street Part 4, Part 5, and Part 6. And uh, and then we're going to cry for a while because we, we're thinking about the the new Nightmare and Freddy vs. Jason and freaking remake episode, which will mm. eventually happen. Though I'm not that scared. I'm just afraid. Oh. oh, yeah. You should be. I live in fear of earthquakes, so. Oh, ah, here we go. I just want I want movies to be louder and louder, and this is a <laughs> loud fucking movie. So here is the uh, the, the teaser trailer for uh, good old Nightmare on Elm Street Four: The Dream Master. There is no one more terrifying on the screen today. the first in fear <laughs> and you thought it was only a movie no! it's a brand new nightmare welcome to wonderland alice a nightmare on elm street part four the dream master rated r starts friday at theaters everywhere uh i found a vhs tape mm -hmm. not in my house on my internet house and it has a short ish paragraph on the back as i like <clears throat> and it says, the biggest and best yet, but it could be an upside down I, so it could be the biggest and the best Yeti. <laughs> I would appreciate that very much if this had a Yeti in it. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> what are you dropping the ball, Fred? <laughs> so here is the CBS Fox uh, videotape here. I think the label on here makes me think it's uh, someone scanned their beautiful... Australian copy. There is a 16 on it, so mm. suitable for persons 16 years and over. So I'm not ah, sure. Yeah. But uh, it's just slapped on the American case, so boom. Mm -hmm. Here we go. That bastard... Whoa, language. <laughs> oh my god. That's just filthy. That bastard son of a hundred maniacs, Freddy Krueger, is back with his finger knives at the ready. <laughs> I don't know why that made me laugh. Uh, to rip into the dreams of a new group of Elm Street teens... This time, however, it appears he may have met his match, no, in the form of Alice, a young red head, who has mastered the powers of drums. Freddy is furious at this threat to his supremacy and embarks on a rampage of terror killing the new arrivals in bloody and imaginative ways. With each of her friends being slaughtered in their sleep, Alice must confront Freddy face to face in a spectacular special effects filled, that is true, battle to the finish, there is only one survivor dot. Okay, I'm going to count the dots here. Dot, 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 dot. Or is there? <laughs> Question mark. That's a lot of pause. Yeah. That's a huge pause. So, yeah, I'm loving this. Mm. Uh, so, New Line Cinema slapped this baby out on the world. So, we're picking up where part three left off, which I think really works in this movie's favor. Holy crap. Yeah. I think it works <laughs> maybe a little less in in its favor for part five, but we'll get into that. The opening song has real good lyrics, unless you listen to them. <laughs> and then uh, we're off, dude. Like I, I think this movie is the least subtle of all of the frickin' Nightmare on Elm Street movies in the beginning of the movie. I think Oh yeah. they fully expected people to be in it to win it. Like, there is no... There's some introducing people, catching people up in this, but dude, no, no, no. It's it's wild, and it's as subtle as a slap in the face. Oh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, like you say, straight from the off, you know, with, like, this really, like, almost hyperkinetic, uh, not just the camera work, but the, the kind of stunts. It's almost like some kind of uh, fucking crazy Hong Kong movie or something in parts. Which is interesting, because uh, this director mm. has been kind of working in Hong Kong lately, which is... Very strange. Oh, really? Uh, Interesting. For a, a, where is he from? This is uh, Rennie, Rennie Harlan, by the way. Is it Finland, I think? Wow. Finland is the uh, China of Europe. Mm. 
coincidentally, when you and I were going to touch base real quick to make sure we were still on for recording mm. uh, yesterday, we were like, cool, let's let's watch the movie. And I'm like, yeah, I haven't watched either. And you're like, holy shit, it's his birthday. Yeah, he uh, so, t- uh, turned 60 yesterday. It was just like, holy wow. shit, you know. Just... Happy belated birthday, Rennie Harlan. Yeah. Man. So this director, he did a movie that I find very funny. I've never seen it. Hmm. <laughs> he did a movie called Driven. With Sylvester Stallone, it's an action movie. Oh, I forgot about that, yeah. I the, find this very funny because uh, my buddy Scott and I were in the theater. I think we were in the theater watching something. I have no idea what it was. But uh, they had the trailer for Driven. and they, So the, the whole trailer for Driven goes on and goes on. And they save the title, Driven. <laughs> and in the trailer guy voice, my best friend Scott leans over to me and goes, You'll be Driven. <laughs> From the theater, screaming. <laughs> and so right when the trailer got it ended and everything got really quiet, I just burst out <laughs> laughing. Like, ah, it was, oh, my God. That's good on you, Scott. Mm. I don't even know if he listens to the show, but good on he. Indeed. But, uh, yeah, Rennie Harlan, he did a horror movie right before uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, the, the Dream Master, called Prison, that I cannot remember if I've seen before. Yeah, I, I know I definitely have it. Uh, um, yeah. Good old Vigo. I always mix it up with um, the House movie that's uh, that's the prison film. Right. Is it House 3? Yeah, the horror show. Oh, right, yeah. Which is uh, a David Blythe joint, although he got fucking fired from the... Oh. David Blythe being the director of Death Warmed Up. I just realized I've, I've had a copy of this for years, but I've never watched it. Mm, I need to revisit it too. Hmm. But yeah, I, I I don't think I've ever seen Prison. No. And of course, uh, he did Die Hard 2 mm-hmm. and The Adventures of Ford Fairlane, <sighs> which luckily didn't kill his career. <sighs> I think Cutthroat Island did that. Oh, yeah. Hey, wow, 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 wow. He's a very interesting director. When you're talking about his like frenetic style, the Hong Kong craziness, like I think he really, really was influenced by stuff like that, like like uh, Wicked City or, mm. or or Naked Killer or John Woo or you know anything John Woo did seems like wow. I mean, I'm surprised no one pulled any guns in this movie and started shooting at Freddy, which probably would have helped. Oh yeah, I mean, there's the shots where it's like straight out of one of those, or like a spaghetti western or something. You know, like the framing and everything. It's, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so style over substance. What a shocker in a Nightmare on Elm Street movie. <laughs> oh my god. Well, having said that, I mean, um, and there's a reason. I mean, I'll get to this kind of later. I, um, I'm not, I'm not so sure about that myself. Um, I think this uh, film is not only kind of underrated. It maybe has a little bit. No, I'm not saying loads necessarily, but maybe has a little bit more going on under it than um, might be initially apparent. I don't know. I see what you're doing there. I like it. I, I take back everything I've said. Oh no! Don't, do that. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't you dare take this away from me, which is me taking myself away. <laughs> Uh, okay. This composer, uh, good old, uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Craig Safan. I don't think he'd worked on any of the uh, Nightmare on Elm Street movies before. No, no. Uh, but he has a very interesting career. He did uh, good old Last Starfighter. <clears throat> Excuse oh. me, Last Starfighter. Uh, he did the soundtrack for the legendary Roller Boogie. Oh, right. Starring Linda Blair. Wow. As well as Warning Sign, a movie that still scares me to this day. Right. Oh yeah, yeah, man. That I guess anything diseases related kind of scares me. Mm, oh, gotta hear that. So no final destinations and no diseases. I'm out. Peace out. Bye. Mm-hmm. I should cut that. Uh that was terrible. So. Oh, don't worry. <laughs> I'm barely holding it together again. Hey, that's what I want. I wouldn't want you to have it together unless it was you and I together. <laughs> Hello? Hello? Now, speaking of music, this has the most rockin' songs. Mm. Like, this just peppers the soundtrack with this bizarre late 80s, we don't know what the fuck is going on, we don't know what the 80s are anymore kind of music. Oh yeah, I think the 80s did in itself at that point. Exactly, like, there's this, there's those weird eras where things can't be defined. <laughs> like, uh, so we got... Um, the Divinals doing a song. I always recognize the Divinals instantly. Mm, mm. Um, mainly because 
their song "I Touch Myself" in accompanying music video. Mm-hmm. Whoa, that was very important to my <laughs> me turning into a man. Mm. Uh, Chrissy Amphlett was uh, rest in peace. She was a lovely, lovely woman. Oh, doctor. Oh, yeah, man. I went from vaguely gay to not vaguely very heterosexual mm. in my my talking. <laughs> Who can keep up with me? Oh, not me, apparently. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about the cast as we go through the major scenes here. Uh, we, we got, um, I, I love IMDb listing in credits order, so yeah, n- not fucking helpful. <laughs> oh, is this from like, oh, right, yeah. Not as sad. Uh, they are actually billed on the credits. So this was, um, I think it was the first film where Robert Englund, he was uh, first billed. I believe. Yes, um, good for him. Jeez, yeah, took long enough. Yeah. Yeah, one thing I, uh, one of the first things I got on my notes here that I kind of like about this, we've got, um, kind of reminds me of in, um, you know, um, from Twin Peaks to Twin Peaks, Fire Walk With Me, because of course I can't talk about anything on this podcast without, or anything ever without bringing Twin Peaks into it. <laughs> You're my favorite season three meme. <laughs> I, oh, I am. You I, are. I am your favorite meme. Oh, well, thank That's you. Right. That uh, warms my heart to hear. Um, <laughs> but it, it reminds me of um, the whole thing of, you know, uh, Patricia Arquette turning into uh, is it Tuesday Night here. It reminds me a lot of, you know, from going from Twin Peaks, we had Laura Flynn Boyle to, um, to uh, was it Moira Kelly? And, you know, the yes. sort of debates of have we, have we downgraded or upgraded, for want of a better way of uh, yeah, like describing it. My career it. has taken off. I'll see you when I see you. Yeah. Yeah. What do you um, think of that, this sort of change? And do you have any kind of kind of preference or i mean that they they mm. obviously kind of play it differently and there's kind of a different vibe about exactly. them which um i think kind of works because you know everything the character's gone through last time it doesn't feel jarring or anything to me particularly no i, I think the actress didn't even didn't try to, to just mimic patricia arquette i think they just this is what your character's like she said okay and so they went for it there was it seems it's almost seamless the way they did it yeah yeah and and honestly, for people back then, they wouldn't have noticed. Like, I mean, Patricia Arquette, she got big, but not so big that she wasn't a household name. Mm, so it wasn't mm. like, oh, like Jodie Foster not coming back for like, oh yeah, yeah, whatever. But so yeah, no, I I, I really do uh, I do like this actress, and I'm looking I'm looking at her fairly prolific. She's still working today. All right, but I'm just focusing on her horror stuff because I'm a cool dude. Mm. That's how cool dudes work. So she'd be back for New Nightmare. Spoiler alert. Whoa. Oh, uh, She'd be yeah. in the, uh, the Fat Boys Are You Ready for Freddy music video, which is very important. <laughs> yeah, she's done some some recent horror. I think she might be one of those actresses who's like, well, people remember me from that, so yeah, I want to work. <laughs> yeah, of course. But what else? Well, so what else was she in that was so? Well, before uh, this film, it was all uh, TV stuff, it seems. And um... God, this cast list is driving me crazy. <laughs> Why did they put it in this freaking? I, I, I know we struggled with his name last time. Uh, uh, Ken Sagos. Mm-hmm. Uh, God, I, I just have no idea. It's like, ah, <laughs> that's how it goes. <laughs> and he's like, I hate you. Uh, he is. Just he just brightens up the screen whenever he's on mm, it. Mm. I, I really, I really like him. Yeah, uh, he has something in this movie that drives me bonkers. Oh yeah, which is, that? well, he drops a fucking car. Oh yeah, on Freddy Krueger, he drops a car on him because you know his his power in dreams is super strength, and uh, uh, Freddy recovers rather quickly. The thing that bothers me about this movie that <laughs> I should probably just get over real quick. Is uh, Freddy so unstoppable that it's just fucking hopeless? Well, this is it. It's like, for God's sake, man, your 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 dog just by pissing fire has just opened oh, the gates of hell and that. and brought him back. It's like, and you think a fucking car's gonna kill him? It's um, uh, Jason the dog, of course. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, and I, I have some great dog acting from that dog. I love. Oh that yeah, dog. He's yeah. So too, he's man. so into it. Probably for treats. He likes treats. Of course. Little liver snaps. I mean, that's, I know that's really racist. Dogs <laughs> eat other stuff. I just get frustrated because I like when people use their dream powers. Like, that's what I love about part three is people like kicking Freddy's ass at least for a bit. Yeah. You know, like, except for that nerd 
mm. with the Dungeons and Dragons. I mean, I, hmm. I know me calling anyone a nerd is <laughs> pretty pretty much the kettle calling the kettle a kettle kettle <laughs> black. And yeah. then he he just runs full speed. I'm I'm winning. I'm gonna go get within arm's length. <laughs> Like, okay, except for that guy doing that shit. No, I, I just, I really enjoy Freddy getting his butt kicked. Yeah. I'm not siding with Freddy. I don't know. Well, that that <laughs> kind of comes into something I'll talk about in a bit that I kind of got from the uh, brief bit of um, making of and all that I got to see. I have fun. I have some topic to discuss on that very matter. But the dog pissing fire waking up Freddy is outrageous. <laughs> outrageous i mean between like jason getting awakened by lightning you know in, in uh was that part six yeah yeah and and him getting awakened by a psychic in part seven you know it's like what but this dog pissing thing <laughs> is the best and they they you know they get the little fake dog leg that they lift and then shoot <laughs> fire <laughs> I, I, Simon, actually, I would like you, I have this in my will, mm. uh, it's your job to arrange for a dog to to piss fire on my grave, mm-hmm. which, of course, will be in a junkyard. So just that's just giving you a heads up on that. No problem. Got it, Bring me back. <laughs> I, and I love the whole sequence with the, the, the planet junkyard. Mm. where he's mm. screaming freddy's back freddy's back and they just keep panning back and it's the whole planet of that's a junkyard and it just holy shit like that is one of the most iconic scenes to me of the whole series is that shot because that was yeah. a big thing in the promotional materials it just really ah. blew my mind still blows my mind years later and I, you know i love a good matte painting like as much as the next guy and our other returning uh cast here was uh joey yeah Joey Rodney Eastman, mm-hmm. uh, son of George Eastman, the Italian actor. But of course. No, I wish. Why aren't you my son? <laughs> Let's see. What's up with this guy? Uh, he's a Quebecian, and he was in that I Spit on Your Grave remake, which I'll I'll never watch. Yeah, I hear that. Mm, sorry, guys. <laughs> Everyone's really angry with me. Oh, my God. <laughs> no, I like this kid. Uh, he He's talking. He, he found his... His voice in the other movie. <laughs> He'll be back in Freddy vs. Jason. That's incredible. Oh, really? Nice. Uh, but he was in uh, Chopping Mall. He was in a cult uh, favorite TV show called Millennium. I don't know how what character he played on that show, because I'm naughty and I've never seen that show, but I know it's oh, people well, dig that it. So makes sense, because he says he was in an episode of The X-Files as well, apparently. As was... Uh, yeah, I saw that. Uh, was it Tuesday night, maybe? Tuesday night, yes. She was in, she was in The x I almost said the X-Men. She <laughs> played White Storm. Right. So there's our three people. Freddy makes very quick work of Joey. Joey, his his secret weakness <laughs> is horny. Mm. And the naked lady in his bed. And then his mom finds him. And Lietta and I noticed <laughs> that when Freddy kills you in the dream world, you don't wake up covered in blood, mm. slashed up. Freddy's like trying to cover his crimes now. <laughs> It's like, ah, oh, make it look like a heart attack. <laughs> Wacky. I love how I don't think I'd ever noticed until last night, you know, the reveal where his mum sees of like how he's floating in this, you know, fucking <laughs> swimming pool that's under the bed somehow. <laughs> and why would it's you good. scream? I'd be like, this is an elaborate prank by my son who used to be mute. Yeah. I should be used to this by now. Oh, and that's something else that made me laugh before that of the, um, whatever, have I got it down here? There's the kind of gratuitous um, MTV cameo. Yes, they keep playing that fucking promo. Oh, my God. That guy, I remember I was such an MTV kid, Mm -hmm. and that's why I am so familiar with this film, because they played a lot of the, I think they played the entire making of, this was a a video called uh, Making of Nightmare on Elm Street 4, and I think they played the whole damn thing. Right. Because I was hip to the Freddy thing by this age, uh, in, in 1988, but they were hype, hype, hype in this movie so much. And then they ran this making of, so I mean, the special effects, all of how they did this were completely ruined mm. before I ever saw part four. Didn't affect my enjoyment of it. No. Because like most kids, I, I have the memory of a, a fruit a fruit bat, a mm. fruit fly, right. or uh, a piece of fruit, like a banana. I hear that. So, so we got new characters, the amazing uh, Alice, 
Uh, we'll talk about Lisa Wilcox in a second. I really just need to talk about Dan, uh, played by Danny Hassel, because he's a quote unquote major league hunk. Mm. Yeah, boy. <laughs> Dan, we, we should just do a show about him. Uh, we'll be seeing him again in uh, Nightmare on Elm Street 5, The Dream Child, because he apparently is full of sperm. <laughs> Yeah, baby. Uh, but no, Alice is played by Lisa Wilcox. Uh, she is our, our our pal who's going to inherit the dream powers from uh, good old... I already forgot her name. <laughs> K- I just Kirsten? watched this last night. Kirsten or Kristen? Kristen. Oh my Kristen. god, help. Please help. <laughs> yeah, help us all. <laughs> so yeah, she, she inherits the dream power with uh, the one thing they didn't want to pay for, which was good special effects so they borrowed the animator who did all the weird lightning from uh hellraiser to come in and draw the weird ethereal dream power shooting out of people's chests yeah which i love uh but this actress um she came back to horror later it seems she worked with robert england a lot that's funny she came back after going shit why do people keep asking me to come to these uh Freaking conventions. Oh, I get it. Okay, I'll do horror again. She's just this really, really timid character. Uh, she has uh, an alcoholic father, um, and she has these uh, fantasies of telling people off all the time. <laughs> it's pretty great. Mm. And her brother's the Karate Kid. What is her brother's name? God help me. Is it Rick? Yeah. Rick. I should have so, remembered that. Uh, Andrus Jones is it? Is this him? Rick. Rick, 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 Rick. The Karate Kid was really, really popular, okay? Mm-hmm. Really, really damaging to the movie popular. Like, <laughs> I don't mind him doing his kung fu kickery. Because you can tell he's been taught to to do some of these moves. Yeah. Uh, he has, like, one kick that he does a thousand times. but So he's good at that, and I'm not good at that kick, so I'm impressed. <laughs> but the whole dojo sequence is terrible. <laughs> it- Really does kind of stick out like a sore thumb. I mean, yeah, of course wow. it kind of like leads in and it fits to, you know, when his kind of power is assimilated into Alice before the uh, finale and all that. It, it it fits in, but the scene itself, I know what you mean, it, it's kind of like, um, oh, so this is still Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah. And then he fights Invisible Freddy. I'm like, what is even <laughs> happening? And he fights the glove, which is amazing. He does not do so good there. Nope. Uh, but he's a great character. He really cares about his sister. He yeah. deals with his dad's bullshit with humor to kind of survive. And his coming back after he dies to to talk to his sister and kind of give her hope. It's just such a great sequence. Like, this movie gives a shit about the characters. Oh, totally, yeah. And they're not, um, you know, both him and uh, Dan as well. You know, he's not like a typical jock. And they're both quite kind of... Um you know, quite smart and quite open-minded, you know, to the, you know, it would normally be a case of, oh, no, you're just, you're just a crazy woman or what have you, but, um, yeah, none of that here. It's, yeah, the evidence before him is actually working. Well, exactly, exactly. Then we have the two characters who I think get the least uh, development, a little bit, but, you know, cause they kind of get the, the short end of the glove. Mm-hmm. We've got De- Debbie? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm struggling with these two. Yeah, they. Uh, she's the one who's you know was working out and um, and Elaine, right? No. Elaine is the one who's always working out. Hold no, on. uh, she's. I'm wait, totally confused. no that that's so that's Debbie. Shit, who's played by is this Brooke? I'm gonna butcher this name, the Theus, and um, the uh, one who's kind of a lot more bookish and all that is uh, Sheila, who's uh, played by Toy Newkirk. Thank you, God. It, it, IMDb not having any information and having having them out of order is killing me. Yeah. Anyway. Oh, yeah. <sighs> I mean, I don't need an excuse. <laughs> but, uh, yes, uh, Toy uh, Newkirk, she is, is, our, is our nerd. And uh, she acted a little bit, and then she decided to move into producing. But uh, she's great as the nerd character. She oh, yeah. She is the most useful invention ever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Her pal, uh, Brooke Thice, I'm going with. That's yeah, that's that. probably more like it. Yeah. Uh, her pal, she is the one who's afraid of bugs. She's afraid of roaches, specifically. This will prove to be her undoing in the, the gross-out sequence. We'll see the oh, yeah. the we've got to gross-out the audience sequence really happen with five. Good lord. Oh, yeah, man. Let's get nasty. 
Uh, but she's she's the unconvincing weight weightlifting gal. Yeah, yeah. Just because in order for Freddy to be able to get her, she has to hold the the bar in a really awkward position. I'm like, that's not that's. I mean, I took high school like a weightlifting class in high school, and I I knew that's mm. not how you do the bar. Mm. That's what those little grips are. Even Lietta was like, that's not how you do it. That's not how you hold it. But they had to because <laughs> they couldn't have Freddy grab the inner part of the bar and push it down because they had to show him dominating her by holding the outside of the bar. Maybe that's me reaching. Yeah, no, I, I kind of understand what you mean. But they don't establish her as a jock until like almost right before she gets killed. No, it's she's probably, um, yeah, Sheila, she's kind of a little bit more developed. Uh, whereas, yeah, Debbie, you know, it's like you say, it's kind of almost an afterthought. Yep. I hate roaches and I work out. I'm dead. Yeah, exactly. I mean, obviously, we the screenplay does like these people, uh, but the um, God, this is, if I'd written down any of these characters' names, it would have helped me <laughs> a little. Just, just saying, bro. Uh, Sheila, uh, like her death is just really heartbreaking because you know she has asthma, and Freddie, of course, would uh, pick on people for their their infirmities because he's a cool guy. And uh, yeah, he, she just suffocates to death at her desk, and I'm like, holy shit, that's dark. Because it's 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 within the realm of possibilities. Yeah, exactly. Who ever heard of someone dying of asthma at such a young age? And I'm like, F- fucking lots of people. Like, uh, yeah, it's a serious condition. <laughs> Maybe not in the eighty. Maybe they cured asthma in eighty seven. <laughs> Maybe just for a year or two. <laughs> it came back like the measles. Exactly. <laughs> okay, we get Robert England and drag. <laughs> oh, yeah. And he has a name. He has something on his name tag. Did you were you able to read what the hell was on his name tag? No, I. I it was like blinking, you'll miss it. And for whatever reason, I didn't rewind to look. Let's see. Let's see if there's anything in the trivia. I have a feeling it's going to be a, a fool's errand here. Name tag. Nope. Name tag. Thanks, guys. Uh, nurse. Well, some of the vials say the, the blood vials that Freddie busts out say England on them. Right. I don't know what his freaking name tag. It's one of those things that just, I knew going back and rewinding it wasn't going to help because I still have the the luscious DVD. There's a picture on IMDb, but it's like totally out of focus, so that doesn't help. <laughs> Robert England in drag is very important. It's just great. He's said, "Wow." I mean, mm. I I have found pleasures in that sequence I I never thought possible. <laughs> Speaking of Hellraiser, wow, I started to. Uh, uh, try to solve his puzzle box. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! My favorite is uh, Kristen's mom is such a still an unbearable biatch. Like, oh Jesus! She obviously didn't learn anything from the other movie. Nope. Also, she's Spanish now because she's going andale andale. <laughs> <laughs> That's so bad. Oh my God, Lieta and I were not pleased with her triumphant return. That was the actress I almost mentioned there. What was it? Uh, Oh, it plays because she's returning. I presume she, she seems like exactly the same. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. I'm pretty damn sure. The, I I I am looking forward to editing this freaking episode. <laughs> no doubt. Uh, I had thank her you before. We go. I I actually clicked on her before. Is it, it uh, is. Brooke, Brooke Bundy. Bundy? There we go. Yes, thank you, Al Bundy's niece. <laughs> and yeah, she is back from part three. She was so memorable. I forgot. Uh, whoa, hey, go back there, pal. Uh, looks like she retired in the 90s. And mm. da, 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 what else was she in? Oh, she was in some Star Trek, hooray, Next mm-hmm. Generation. She was on Night Gallery. Uh, she's in Twice Dead, which is a DVD I have and I've never seen before. Right. Uh, but yeah, she's she's just ridiculous. <laughs> andale, andale. And then, of course, my favorite line in this movie is when she gives her daughter some sleeping pills. Oh, like, yeah, yeah. The most, like, how gritty is this lemonade? Oh, there's like 50 pills crushed in the <laughs> bottom. It looks, uh, it's like not even, it's like opaque. It's so much fucking pills in it. It's like, never mind letting Freddy kill her. It's like, no, we're just going to shortcut that and then we'll just actually kill you with pills. <laughs> uh, I think the phrase is, see ya, wouldn't want to be ya. Yeah. And, uh, but she says to her mom, like, you just killed me. And I'm like, oh, it's brutal. I love it. Oh, yeah, she had it coming, though. Wait, her mom or, or, or she did? For- uh, her mom. 
Okay, I thought like, yeah. you were just saying, yeah, Kristen, fucking die. <laughs> <laughs> well, she did. She, she she did too technically, but I didn't mean to, uh, <laughs> you know, like I was cheering it on. <laughs> Simon, your, your dark side, I love it. Yeah. Uh, so, so she gets gotten by Freddy after inadvertently pulling good old uh, Alice into the dream world. And, and so when she gets killed, because of their, their lesbian relationship that was cut from the movie... <gasps> Her powers go immediately to Alice. Alice is like, thanks, didn't want this. And the plot machination here is that uh, Freddy needs someone to bring more children in because uh, Kristen was the last of the Elm Street children, which I think it's just the... uh, I was going to make a a homeowners association joke, but (laughs) it was not going to be funny. LOL, BRB, LMAO. TTFN, uh, B L O W, me. <laughs> FML. <laughs> yes, when you're, whenever you're the co host of Doom Show, it's always FML because I, <laughs> I am going to make you suffer. And it means mm. funk my leg. <laughs> funk Thanks, it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, mm. so this has. Probably my favorite scene and sequence, special effects sequence in the whole frickin' franchise. Right. The movie theater sequence. Oh, yeah. I love this as well. Boy, oh, boy. I am loving... I think scenes in movie theaters are starting to really become, like, my new thing I look for. Uh, just I want to watch a movie about people going to the movies. Oh, just before we get to that, though. And there, yeah. I probably will backtrack to a few other things as well, but I will pick up on this because you mentioned a wig. Um this always makes me laugh. So after um, Rick gets um, gets killed and his kind of kung fu fighting powers get transferred into Alice, there's this great bit that uh, oh, and also just to backtrack a little more, there's this, and this is one thing that um, I love about this movie. And I was sort of saying, you know, I think it has maybe not like a hidden depth exactly, but kind of a bit more maybe to it than. Um, Maybe he's normally given credit for. So Alice has this uh, mirror in her bedroom, which initially is completely covered up with photos of her friends and family. And the first photo gets pulled off. It's a photo of um, Freddie and Kristen. Uh, Kirsten? It is Kirsten, isn't it? Ah, uh, whatever. And ha- I've seen these films how many times? You know, from her and Freddie, gone to hell, you know, which turns into flames. So it gets pulled off the mirror. And that's the first time Alice, you know, she kind of catches a glimpse of herself in the mirror. And yes. uh, as all her friends kind of get knocked off, you know, she's kind of seeing more and more of herself while simultaneously, you know, assimilating um, and sort of becoming this kind of uh, gestalt of like um, all of their different kind of strengths and stuff i guess yes. so you have um after rig bites it she's like stood in front of the mirror finds his nunchucks and starts you know doing a bit of a routine and i love this every time it just cracks me up you know when you get the reverse shot of oh, the boy. uh you know clear fucking stunt double wearing a different colored wig and it's like oh dear it is unbelievable like, i love the nunchuckery i love yeah. nunchucks it's great but man that wig Wow, and they yeah. reuse it at some point. I forget. I think they put it on somebody in the in the theater scene mm-hmm. because uh, so the theater scene plays out where she's at the movies. We see a poster of Rennie Harlan's prison. Oh right, yeah, on the wall there, and then they're playing Reefer Madness, <laughs> <laughs> which is wonderful. They were definitely high when they wrote the screenplay. Oh, no doubt. These high school boys and girls are having a hop at the local soda fountain. Innocently, they dance. Innocent of a new and deadly menace lurking behind closed doors. Marijuana, the burning weed with its roots in hell. And uh, so she flies into the movie screen. It's just such a wonderful shot. It just, oh man. And the theater Mm. has those steep ass freaking stairs on the balcony, which uh, the the Tampa Theater, the one we go to here, the oldest uh, theater in town. Uh, that you know hasn't been destroyed by a hurricane. It has those steep, steep freaking stairs. And you're like, I'm on the second floor, please. <laughs> I just want to not die. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I saw demons there. Man, it was great. Oh no doubt. Going to see going to see demons in a creepy theater. You know, because it's a movie about a creepy ass theater. Oh, it was great. Perfect. One of the things that's really disturbing in this movie, I think it's like symptomatic of the late '80s. I, I hesitate to talk about it. Mm. Rick and Alice's house, what killed their mom was tea towels. Right. Because there's like 
five or six tea towels just all over that kitchen. Like, Lieta's like, what's with all the tea towels? And now I can't unsee all the tea towels. There's a tea <laughs> towel, you know, by the sink. There's a tea towel by the microwave. There's a tea towel by the frickin' uh, toaster oven. There's a tea towel by the spoons. I don't know what... I think they wasted a lot of money on this as the budget was just eaten up by tea towels. Maybe, yeah, that's what did her in and is like... and. Maybe even the dad was going to go that way. And he's like, no, I'm going to go tea towel total and I'm going to start becoming an alcoholic instead. So she do. <laughs> Her mother choked to death on a tea towel. That's just <laughs> heartbreaking. <laughs> 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 so, Simon, what are, the, what are some, uh, some scenes that uh, stand out to you? Any other cool little things about this movie? Well, oh, I think uh, Esther, uh, my dog, wants to weigh in by the sounds of it at the moment. What, what her favourite scenes are? Is that Jason the dog? Uh, it could be. She sounds like she's fucking possessed or something. <laughs> I can hear the other dog she's talking to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, speaking of little uh, kind of details and stuff in the background, did you notice the name of the diner? Holy shit, no, I did not. It's the uh, the Crave Inn. hey Yeah. <laughs> That's incredible. Love I want to, if I was a woman and uh, maybe I will be, mm-hmm. I would totally freaking cosplay as uh, Alice in her uniform. Mm. When she starts working double shifts to stay awake, I would totally wear that. That's such a great look. Yeah, definitely. Oof, what an image I have in my mind now. Hey, you're welcome. <laughs> I would find a better fucking wig than the nunchuck lady. Oh, God, is it hot in there? Uh, hey. Wait, what? Um. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, there was a cheeky cameo, did you notice, of um, sort of kind of almost going back to the first film in a way. You remember uh-huh. we had we had, Lin, we had Lin Shay as the teacher in the first one. Yes. So did you spot who, and I'm pretty sure this is who I, yeah, no, I'm damn sure it is, uh, who's talking about dreams and the dream master, you know, which is on every school curriculum, of course. The the bartender from the second film? Oh, yeah, he was him as well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had to think for a minute. Bob Shay, right? Yeah, that's right. Oh my god, dude. He is such a great actor. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's not a baby at all, you know, behind all that, looking clearly fucking stressed out with how, like, down to the wire the whole production of this film was going. Because uh, a <laughs> bit of, without getting into behind the scenes yet, there was a bit of kind of tension between him and uh, Rennie Harlan, you know. Uh, oh. Not because, I think it was more just kind of a lack of constant confidence in the fact that they, you know, they like people typically do all the time now, they'd made a release date before they'd probably even written a script, and they were just yeah. like, you oh, know. Oh, yeah. Trying to churn these things out. Yeah, that's right. Straight after the um, cinema bit, uh, yeah, maybe my favourite bit of the film is where the um, where Dan and Alice on the way to go and uh, meet Sheila, who yes. is now like, uh, you know, uh, lifting weights and um, listening to Sinead O'Connor. And, <laughs> uh, you know, it's about to, you know, Freddy's about to sneak in and all of that. They get basically stuck in a loop, kind of like deja vu, going round and round and round. And I, I flipping love that. And uh, that combined with um, Debbie's actual death scene. I'd, I'd never seen this film before until, oh, I don't know, it's like several years back now, maybe nearly 10. But I um, watched it through a bunch of other slashes and I finished with this about three or four in the morning and that oh my God. blew my fucking mind. And uh, as you can imagine, nice. grossed me out more than a little bit. I wasn't quite ready for it. Um, <laughs> and it, nasty. Oh, it is. It's just so like conceptually and just fucked up. I think because it's so kind of fantastical and there's that black comic kind of streak obviously coming with Freddy, that kind of um, takes the edge off. It's sort of like, uh, and this links to the guy who did the effects for the sequence was um, Screaming Mad George, who he'd go oh, on to yeah. do uh, the effects for uh, Society like a year later. And it's the same kind of thing of like, if it wasn't so blackly funny, it might it would almost be too much to take. You know, it's just so like messed up. But uh, yeah, it hadn't occurred to me last night, there's a, a kind of throwaway line very early on where um, Rick, he's talking to somebody in the classroom and he says, I'm going to have to look this up so I think I'd written it verbatim so I don't get this wrong. Oh yeah, he's he's overheard, he's saying, however, Kafka and Goethe have never been irreconcilable to me. <laughs> yes, I caught that too. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> now I wonder if that has any connection oh, at all to, uh, you know, Debbie's fate, you know, having this kind of metamorphosis and all of that at the end. You, you nailed know. that, that's great. Oh, well, thank you. The Sorrows of Young Debbie. Indeed. Man, I love it. <laughs> uh, so we have, and this actually might be my, well, maybe Tide, favourite part of the uh, the movie, where um, 
Alice is getting ready, you know, and getting all her various uh, knickknacks and uh, totems from all her uh, dead pals together. You know, this kind of rocking 80s music on the soundtrack. Mm. And never mind, like, clears all the stuff off um, the mirror, finally. So that's finally clear. And, you know, she's reached this, like, total... uh, self actualization or what have you. You know, just to kind of draw a big, uh, you know, fuck yeah kind of exclamation mark behind it. She clears all the shit right off her desk as well. Completely unnecessary, but just to say, you know, all right, Freddy, you know, I'm ready. They should have had her do um, a speech like the, from the legend of Billie Jean. Oh, right. And, yeah. and cut all her hair off and be like, <laughs> that would have been badass. But yeah, that's a great scene. I love that. In the, uh, the realm of trivia, uh, one of the things that really surprised me was at the end of the movie, they def- she tries to defeat Freddy with uh, the stupid machine that Sheila designed mm. to uh, to to frickin scare roaches away, and so she uses this as her her laser gun to shoot Freddy. It's it's so bad, and of course it does nothing. Yeah. Further driving yeah. me fucking crazy. After that, Freddy gets ripped apart by all the souls escaping from his body, mm-hmm. and they have the moment. Where the hands coming out of his body rip his frickin' jaw open. Yeah. For a split second, and I am, man, they did not dwell on this, although they probably wanted to. Mm. He's just walking around with his head hanging on the, the sinew mm. cover, you know, like hanging on by not even his spinal column. Just, it's really grotesque. Oh, and yeah. And so my, my brain said, what was cut from this movie? And of course, because, uh, the MPAA is fake garbage. Mm. Uh, there's really not anything that I can find in the trivia about it having any troubles with getting from an NC-17 down to an R. Mm. Mm. Uh, I not watched the documentary on this for a long time. I have a feeling they they really didn't run into a lot of trouble because they were making so much money. Plus, past, you know, from two really onwards through to this, it's more, it's gone, you know, there's still horror elements, but it's more kind of almost leaning into fantasy and like kind of teen movies, you know. And that might be why some of the kids didn't wake up covered in their own blood and all that stuff, just to kind of sidestep. I mean, I can't imagine anyone watching the roach sequence and not being like, this is wildly disturbing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, MPAA are too fucking stupid. They wouldn't get the black humor at all. Uh, but there is something in the uh, the trivia about some cuts. There was some extended sequences. Uh, there were other dreams that they cut. And just little things that kind of tighten up the movie. Which, honestly, by the time this movie's over, I don't, I'm like, I want more. Mm. And that might be really smart on their part, is to, to leave people wanting more. I mean, it certainly yeah, I think so. helped this make a fuck ton of money. Oh, yeah, I think the most of the series, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, Which is why I think that this one, for me, is like, I like this better than three. Yeah, and I think I do. It could be my just super, super familiarity with this one. I'm not sure. Uh, But there's a sequence where Alice and Rick's dad turn into Freddy. Oh, right. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, that's I kind of wanted that in the movie. Yeah, that would have, because, you know, of that whole undercurrent of just what a kind of, um, I mean, he's not like a monstrous kind of drunk or anything, but yeah, they could have kind of leaned into that, you know. Exactly. And uh, so I need to read, again, I'm dropping the ball and reading these uh, adaptations. Mm. Apparently, uh, those scenes are now lost completely. I don't think that these deleted scenes exist, including some extra stuff from the beach scene. Oh yeah, and uh, the beach whole the whole beach sequence, which is another signature of Freddy, especially for uh, finding animated gifs of Freddy, <laughs> is him putting the sunglasses on in the shade. Oh yeah, or in the sun, <laughs> not the shade. <laughs> but uh, I need to read one of those books and see if, since they're usually based on the screenplay, if any of those scenes are in there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let's say it's all stuff we can come back to. Oh, dude, yeah, we're going to do a wrap-up on this bad boy. I think the best podcasts uh, do their research after they're done recording. <laughs> of course. <laughs> you tell me you do it any other way? No. Uh, oh, yeah, one of my favorite things is uh, Tuesday Night's Bikini is so not a bikini. It's, like, very conservative, and sure enough, they wanted her to wear something more relieving, and she said, no thanks. Mm. Uh, is there any other trivia you want to, any trivia bombs you want to drop on us here? You know, Rennie Harlan, he really had to um, kind of badger um, Bob Shea to hire him because, you know, he wasn't really known for anything beforehand. 
And I think one of the main reasons that he did hire him in the end, not just because of his tenacity, and also because they were so, you know, we, we can't wait around here. They'd ask somebody else. I can't remember exactly. Well, yeah, I think they'd ask Wes Craven to come and maybe do a rewrite of the script and maybe for him to do it. But there's somebody else, I think, another um, director. Oh, there, was, there is one. Uh, yeah, Dutch director Dick Mass, apparently. Um, oh, my God. That would have been crazy. So I think he was doing Amsterdam the same year, which, God, I still need to get off my ass and watch that. Um, oh, Amsterdam is very special. Like mm, it does It does look really good. Rennie Harlan, he just kept, you know, sort of saying, you know, what a fan he was and this and that. But I still don't think Bob Shea was convinced. But the thing that he says in the... Um, making of that made me laugh that convinced him was the fact that uh, Rennie Harlan is such a kind of brick shithouse of a bloke. He thought, well, this guy looks like he's going to have stamina at least and, you know, <laughs> maybe to be working some long hours. That <laughs> coupled with the fact this guy was apparently poor as dirt, you know, he's saying he's eating like, uh, you know, pork and beans out of a can and he was coming Aww. in in the same clothes and starting to smell a bit funky. So, yeah, they may be <laughs> feeling a little bit sorry for him. But, uh, yeah, he, he very much warmed him by the end and this is quite, you know, heartwarming uh, story of him when after the premiere, you know, they're, they're driving around you know in a limo drinking vodka this or that and um uh, rennie harlan's mum's on the phone and uh, apparently um she like speaks swedish and bob shea can speak a bit and he's, he's talking to her on the phone and saying oh you should be really proud of your son he made a great movie and all that could cue the mother you know bawling down the phone which is Aww. it's lovely that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's nice that it all worked out. But um, so yeah, the writing was apparently a bit of a saga. Uh, there's some people who were uncredited because of a writing strike that came in, which obviously didn't help. And as a result, oh, that never helps. Oh no! So as a result, many many cooks, you know, sort of stirring and throwing into that particular uh, broth. And uh, yeah, following from that, a very you know chaotic production. But uh, they say you know maybe that kind of helped as often these things do, and you kind of pressure to bring some. Uh, uh, creativity out the final thing i have here which um kind of alluded to before of you know uh i can't remember what we we're saying you know freddie freddie being cool or what have you was rennie harlan said he thinks of freddie being like bond or rambo and that we're we're almost kind of rooting for him and i thought <laughs> you know and thinks of him as kind of being cool which i'd kind of find a bit weird but you can kind of see it you know even in you know case in point like you say him putting the shades on and all that which is kind of an iconic shot now you know of um i suppose maybe from you know three onwards when we got the backstory of you know he's not just this um evil guy you know he's kind of been made this way or what have you so that that kind of uh, muddies the waters a bit i suppose yeah i still always side with the uh the teenagers mm. but um that's because I'm immature, <laughs> and I relate to them, especially when they're so hunky, like Dan. Oh, yeah. Uh, so how do you like this one, sir? Oh, I love it. You know, I um, like yourself, I think I like it more than three, although, although it really is too close to call. Um, but yeah, it, w it would be, you know, it'd be one and two, pretty much fighting it out. And then, you know, three and four, not too far behind them. And yeah, I do genuinely think this is maybe... I don't know whether it is underrated or not, because I've not really got um, enough of a sense of uh, people's thoughts on it. But you, you know, by compared to how much everyone always raves about... Uh, even so, sometimes like people aren't really into horror films. You know, Dream Warriors is the one that always gets kind of uh, raved about. But I, I put this, you know, pretty much on a par with it, you know. Nice. What about yourself? Uh, yeah, the, this is a joy to watch. And yeah, I love it. It's... um. This one I'm super, super familiar with, like I was saying, with the, the making of stuff and all that. Even with all of the background things, I still really enjoy uh, firing this one up and getting lost in it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I have a few little criticisms that you know could have been improved by just a slightly longer cut, like I was saying. But yeah, it's it's just the formula is in place. We are we're still doing the roller coaster ride. They can't finish the series. At least the the little coda with Freddy in the, the wishing fountain, like his reflection, it really doesn't, it doesn't scream sequel, but it, yeah, it's still, yeah, we're coming back. But I, I like it. I think it's pretty, you know? I was going to mention that uh, right at the beginning where you said, you know, uh, it's straight away, you know, there's just, you know, we're straight into it, like, say, super energetic and not kind of at all subtle. But <laughs> yes. kind of c conversely, you know, this ending compared to, you know, the, um, you know, I'll be back sort of moment, uh, the end of all the first three. Th this is decidedly mm. a lot more subtle and kind of a blink and you'll miss it sort of moment almost. I think they were going for something like the the dollhouse light coming on. Yeah, it's kind of like one gear down from that almost, you know. Yeah. She don't have like a creepy laugh or anything. Man. Ugh, oh, so good. Mm -hmm. Uh so yeah, dude, let's uh let's freaking move on to part five. Uh folks, 
here is the teaser trailer for A Nightmare on Elm Street Part 5. The Dream Child. Oh, Dream Child, you're the one. Oh, I'm, not, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to terror, Freddy knows best. <laughs> Now, Freddy delivers. It's a boy! I don't know how, but now he's back! His greatest masterpiece. Better not dream and drive! <laughs> a Nightmare on Elm Street 5, The Dream Child. The party just starts! Rated R. Starts Friday, August 11th at theaters everywhere. <laughs> One, two, three, go. go. If you can just have the keyboard ready for some music cues, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> I have not played with that yet. I really should do, yeah. I you should. Oh my god, it'd be mm. fucking hilarious. I used to have all my noise making toys on my desk back in the old episodes well actually this kind of has a and we'll get into this you know the music and this but if we, we do anything really early 80s or as any of that what do you call it synth poop then we'll uh, <laughs> maybe have a bit of an improv jam while we're doing it yes okay that was the teaser trailer for nightmare on elm street 5 the dream child or as i call it nightmare on elm street 5 desperately seeking amanda <laughs> So, Simon, this is this is important. I want to mark this. This is mm. a very important moment in this series. This is the last Freddy movie of the 80s. This is yeah. 1989. Uh, of course, you know, later we're going to discuss a little bit about um, the, the TV series Freddy's Nightmares. Mm -hmm. But uh, <laughs> this is also the halfway mark of our coverage. Oh, wow. So after this, we've got we've had we've talked about four movies. And then after this, we're going to talk about four movies. Mm. I'd say, as far as our pontificating, we're probably at the 125th mark. Hmm. Because we're going to go on and on forever. We're just never going to stop talking about Freddy ever. Oh, no. Why would we want to stop? I was threatened by one Marky Karloff, friend of the show. He he might call in. He's, he's talking about calling in. Who Ooh. knows when it'll happen? Cool. He has a very interesting story about <laughs> Freddy's revenge. He's like, he's like oh, I'm... I forgot to call into the show. Mm. I've, I've got a revelation that you need to hear about. Oh, Freddy's wow. revenge and me getting a boner. <laughs> but anyway, I don't want to spoil too much. because I don't, I don't know the whole story, but I'm excited. Ooh, me too. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the situation that I'm in in my life currently. I'm happily married. I have one gorgeous daughter. She just turned two. My life could not be going better romantically. I could not dream of anything flowing more naturally, smoothly, and happier than it has been so far. With that said, there's been a small amount of disappointment since the day that I discovered that I was inflicted with the most wicked disease that Freddy Krueger himself had lied to me. When I was a small child, I watched Nightmare on Elm Street 2 Freddy's Revenge with my parents for the very first time. I didn't know anything about sexuality. Yes, of course I had noticed that some people in the world had feet, but I didn't think really much of it. And then came the locker room scene, the shower scene, Mr. P.E. Coach was brought to his stomach by Freddy himself. Freddy being an invisible force, but he was stripped nude. He was spanked, his bare ass scathing with the domination of Freddy's erotic might dripping down his face in the form of pleasured and pained sweat. Then it came for me. Poking out of my tidy whities was the very first erection that I would ever grow in my entire life. Maybe it was the last, I don't know. It was definitely the first erection that I ever grew while looking at a man who happened to be standing in a shower completely nude. Yes, the PE coach was barefoot. As I grew older, I started to realize that women also had feet. 
Freddy Krueger had lied to me. Freddy Krueger is a child murderer. Freddy Krueger is a thing of nightmares. But Freddy Krueger had never been marketed as a thing of existential terror. As the template, the icon for your doubts in yourself, for your disappointment and your devastation in the way that your life comes to be. I'm not saying that my wife doesn't have a penis. She has ten of them. But Freddy lied to me. I don't even like being spanked. There was nothing about my first erection that stood to make sense out of the rest of my life. My name is Marky Karloff. I have yet to have another erection while looking at another man being spanked. I'm beginning to doubt that it's ever going to happen. I'm here before you to share with you to open myself up to the possibility of others out there experiencing my identical terrors and frustrations. Were you deceived by Freddy Krueger? His feet show up in Nightmare on Elm Street 5. I was deceived by Freddy. I hereby reach out to any and all of you who grew your first erections during the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise and who were disappointed to grow up and realize that you were not attracted to floating towels. Please contact me at thepropal.bandcamp.com. Every time someone downloads my music from now on, I will assume that they too were deceived sexually by Freddy Krueger. Were you? We actually have awesome opening titles here. Mm. Unlike the first three films where they had the really shitty titles. <laughs> it says they actually put some money into this one. Mm. It says, you know, A Nightmare on Elm Street 5. And you're like, okay. And then Chalk. The Dream Child. <laughs> yeah, and uh, for the Chalk, it's kind of like, I suppose it's trying to like scratch through like fabric or something, but it kind of almost looks like a jack-o'-lantern. Sort of Ooh, the, uh, the yeah, light and all good that. Good call. Good call. I like that. And uh, sorry, that's a point not to um, correct you or anything, but um, I, I found this kind of interesting. If this was right, I, I neglected to go back and check because so I rewatched the beginning this mm. morning. But I think on the actual credits, the, the five is um, is not there for whatever reason. Oh, shit. Yeah, that's right. No, yeah. I, please correct me. Oh, my God. Yeah, I don't know why that is. They translated that five to 50 pounds. Like, mm. I don't know. How much is how much is a stone weigh in England? Um, 25 pounds? I forget. Anyway, stone. I was trying to make a fat <laughs> joke about myself that <laughs> they gave me the 50 pounds? I don't fucking know. I don't know. 14 pounds. Oh, that's it. Why I didn't I actually pounds. look that up? I can't believe it. I, I, I ate during this movie so that I would be a supermodel like uh, like our friend. Oh, like, like Greta. Greta. Mm. Greta. <laughs> so this was directed by Stephen Hopkins, who did a really interesting movie that his, his debut feature. Uh, he was born in Jamaica, of all places. Oh. Which is why he looks um, like uh, a white dude. I thought he was British, isn't it? Yeah, British, uh, but his first film was filmed in Australia, and it's called Dangerous Game. And I remember renting this, because of course, uh, back in the day, and I'm sure I've talked about this ad nauseum on this show, my mom was obsessed with renting everything off the new shelf. Mm. Always, always, always the new shelf. Uh, and, and so I remember Dangerous Game very well. So a computer expert and his friends manage to disable a department store's security system so they can rob it, but once inside, they find themselves stalked by a killer. Mm, I've never heard of this. It looks interesting. It's really, really stylish. I must have said stylistic for some reason. Really stylish. I think they offend him or cross paths with this as a total nut job, and he ends up just ruining their evening, and they have to fight for their lives. He was a cop on the edge of sanity. I'm suspending you pending further psychiatric tests. They were just some kids out for a good time. No, the bet was that you could break into any computer system in the world. How about uh, Mark Wells Department Store? It was only a simple game. Just relax, there's nobody here. Until he changed the rules. Breaking an entrance. Now, there can only be one winner. Buffy! Dangerous game. I've got something special for you. There's a very similar film that came out 
not too long after that I'm struggling to remember the name of. Uh, but I really want to watch Dangerous Game again. Yeah. I remember just yeah. being really intrigued. <clears throat> Excuse me. Really intrigued by it. And of course, it's freaking shot in Australia with presuming an Australian cast. And Australia makes literally everything better. Mm. And then he went on to do uh, Predator 2, which is incredible. Yeah, that was a revelation for me to revisit uh, maybe a year or two ago. It's um, really held, really holds up, I think. And then he did freaking Judgment Night, which was the big marketing gimmick. Judgment Night! <laughs> it's got rappers and rockers on the soundtrack! boop a doo Oh, wow. Like, whoa, rappers and rockers together? Are you fucking insane? <laughs> oh. Down and out, down and out, down. Walk this way! <laughs> I'm going to sing a lot in this episode. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, he made the Lost in Space movie. <laughs> yeah, that happened. That happened. I saw it in the theaters with my ex-girlfriend, Kim, and I. We were mm. bored out of our fucking minds. Yeah. Although it does have a great line from uh, Gary Oldman, who clearly gave a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> like, what's that sound? He's like, it sounds like blood. <laughs> and we're like, What? <laughs> Yeah, he didn't give a shit. <laughs> oh, fuck, I almost forgot to read the VHS tape. Look out. Oh, well, I was going to say, before you do, uh, this is another milestone for us here. Where is this? Uh, you're speaking of last ones. Maybe the most important thing to note here. Um, according to IMDb, so take this with a pinch of salt, as always, uh, this is the last film in the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise to have been released onto video cassette by Media Home Entertainment. Oh, my God, I've been dropping their... Uh... Been dropping their little uh, logo in mm. every episode. I'm, I'm going to keep doing it because I don't want to change the intro. <laughs> Dude, that's freaking great. Folks at home, the Nightmare on Elm Street 5 trivia, that page is full of information. Uh, it's full of something, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Freddy says bitch like twice, Google Plus. <laughs> mm. Is this interesting to you? Vote it up, brother. Well, most people All thought right. it was apparently, but oh, yeah, let's just not go there. So speaking of the uh, the media home entertainment VHS tape here, um, this is in English, which I just blanked for a second. I forgot how to read English. I was like, oh, what language is this? Uh, it says, for promotional use only, not for resale. Also includes special preview trailers. Bonus includes the Houdini music video, Anyway, I Gotta Swing It. Oh, God, did you watch that? Uh, no, but I uh, I need to. I, I think we'll take a break and I'll look at it. I'm not sure if it's, uh, what do they say? Do you tell me whether you think it's dope or whack? <laughs> we'll, live, we'll live stream our thoughts on it. <laughs> okay, folks, now I'm queue up the Houdini video. Here we go. Okay, so here's the VHS tape. It says the, the line, it's a boy, which I wish Freddie talked like that, like, like Paul Lind. It's a boy. <laughs> Brad is the expert on Paul Lind. We'll have him mm, call in. Mm. So here's the plot synopsis. From tomb to womb, Freddy Krueger's back, ripping up flesh and ripping off one-liners in his most maniacally perverse fright fest yet. This time, he's terrorized a whole new generation of Elm Street kids, a generation yet unborn. <laughs> Wild, right? <laughs> Unable to overpower Alice, the beautiful Dream Master who vanquished him in the Nightmare on Elm Street 4, the Dream Master, Freddy haunts the innocent dreams of her developing fetus. To provide some fiendish fatherly advice. Freddy a father? Hey, like Wally and the Beeves dad, this guy's Mr. Cleaver. Mr. Meat Cleaver. <laughs> yuck, yuck, yuck. And every kid Oh I almost did a different voice, I'm sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> and every kid on Elm Street will get the razor sharp point. <laughs> Zinger. So lullaby and good fright, because Freddy's fifth is a symphony of screams. Mike Clark, USA Today. Color, approximately 91 minutes, 1989. Man, they were going for it with all the puns there. Amazing. Wow. I wish I wish Freddy had a meat cleaver just for fun. Mm. Just five, a four, no, a four meat cleaver glove. Mm. Break his fingers. That's why his arm's all stretched out. <laughs> yeah, they should have done that in that dinner scene, which we'll get to use it on all the fucking guests. Oh, brother. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> We got uh, Lisa Wilcox uh, returns as Alice. She's definitely more blonder in this movie, where I remember her not being blonde at all. I noted that. I thought, you know, is that part of it because maybe she's still, like, got all her dead pals sort of powers and, uh, mm. you know, some of Kristen's, uh, Kristen or Kirsten, I still can't remember which it is, Jesus Christ. <laughs> It's one of them. Uh, but yeah, she's kind of she's kind of taken some of her strength or what have you, you know, and that sort of uh, tinted her uh, hair a different color. 
She's got to love her in this. Uh, we open with her and uh, her boyfriend, Dan, making the sex act. Yeah, this uh, this sequence again. Yeah, another uh, interesting kind of intro and just creepy and very um, blue. Very blue. Um, her, her boyfriend is reprising his role. He was Danny Hassel from, from number four. Mm. So he's back. He'll be with us for a little while. Our teens are graduating from high school. Uh, we got, we got our buddies here. We got Lisa. Uh, we got Yvonne mm -hmm. played by Kelly Joe Minter. Oh, I love her. She is one sassy pants lady. Yeah. She retired from acting, I think. Yeah. It looks 2008. like 2008. Mm. She said, bye guys. Uh, but she was in this. She was in frickin' People Under the Stairs, mm -hmm. which I... God, I need to rewatch that. Me too, oh, man. shit. She's in a movie I never want to see again called The Lost Boys. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. I love The Lost Boys. Yeah, I had no idea who she was in that. And uh, do I still have this page open? Um, who the hell is she in that? She's, I think it says, is it Maria? I don't remember her at all in that movie. Oh, let, let, me, <laughs> let me find this link. Um, and the movie she was in, I can't stand, is Doc Hollywood. Yikes. Oh, is that with Michael J. Fox? Ugh, yuck. Yeah, I think I'd shoot I, that out of that. Fuck. Um, she was also in Popcorn from 1991, which yes. is a wonderful movie. Oh, wonderful. yes. Wonderful. And the most depressing movie I remember as a kid, Miracle Mile, which is why I've been waiting for the nuclear apocalypse ever since. Yeah, I, um, I still need to watch. That seems to have its fans anyway. Um, oh, dude, it's it's incredible. It's it's a fantastic movie. It's just uh, have something light, something with a an prepared to watch afterwards because it'll not put you in a good headspace. Oh, fair enough. Yeah, no, I need to get to that. So I think it's popped up on Netflix. And bizarrely, the um, director um, he added. Uh, gave me a firm request on Facebook, which is Aww. strange. So, yeah, good on him. Uh, seems like a cool dude. I'm going to send you this link for... Um, she's got some pictures. So, yeah, this is from a Lost Boys fan site saying, who was Maria in the movie? <laughs> and it is kind of blink and you'll miss it. And she kind of almost looks a little bit... Um, not different, but kind of. Load, load, load. It was a bit slow when I was trying to load it, yeah. Oh, my God, she's the girl at the... Yeah. <laughs> I remember her. <laughs> and I never noticed flipping Alex Winter and his fucking oh Guns N' Roses uh, <laughs> flipping get up looking at her through. Is that So is that in front of the counter? She's got a TV screen yes. in front of her face. Oh, that's yes. incredible. That's such a good gimmick. So it seems like um, she had some uh, dialogue that was cut out and maybe some of the scenes because apparently it's still in uh, in the novel, uh, novelization, what have you, whichever it is. Oh my goodness, that's freaking amazing. Yeah. I mean, look at her trying to steal the spotlight. Yes. Peeking over her shoulder like, hey... <laughs> Hey, I'm here. <laughs> totally trying to outstage for things and die in waste. Wow. Yvonne is the uh the swimmer. She that's her, her deal. She's the she's a star athlete at the high school. She's the she's the diving champion. Yeah. And she's wearing the body glove. Uh Body Glove is one of the sponsors of this film, which came up recently with uh my buddy Sam and I were watching uh, Picasso Trigger by uh, Andy Sedaris, a sequel to Hard Ticket to Hawaii. And uh, there's so much body glove action in that movie. They were the surfing company who provided the wetsuits. <laughs> and we sat through the entire credits just waiting for them to thank Body Glove. And on the <laughs> last, like almost the very last title, they're like, thank you, Body Glove. I was like, that's right, fuckers. We, we knew it was coming. Body Glove, proud sponsor of the 1989 US Masters. We've also got Greta. So, of course, Erica Anderson has a connection to what else but Twin Peaks. Oh, wow, really? Because we can't... Oh, wow! Yep, I knew you'd like this. Yeah! Oh, amazing! <laughs> we are never... Yeah. <laughs> never gonna get away from Twin Peaks ever on this show, dude. Yeah, we're, we're still in the red room forever. <laughs> so, Erica Anderson, uh, let's see... Oh my god, she was Zandali. Holy fuck. Zandali, I believe, is an erotic thriller, a rather um, infamous erotic thriller because of oh, the right, bonkers, yeah. bonkers, bonkers Nicolas Cage performance. <laughs> and she is the titular Zandali. Oh my god, that's so fucking funny. Oh, this cast as well, Jesus. Judge Reinhold and her sitting together. <laughs> okay, I need to give Zandali a shot. I've only seen the clips of you know who getting fucking bonkers and painting his whole body with black paint or whatever. Oh wow! But uh, yeah, she did some TV work. She she did all the uh, sexy shows like Red Shoe Diaries and Dream On, and I think she said, 
I'm out of here. So she's retired too. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I I just wish her character had made it longer in this movie. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she's she's a wannabe fashion model. Her mother has grand plans for her, mm. uh, which the mother is. Uh oh. Editing. Mm. Wow, 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 wow. Okay, here we go. The actress who plays her mother is Pat Sturges. <laughs> Whatever. She played woman in lobby in Pretty Woman. She was the lobby woman, not the pretty woman. <laughs> but anyway, um, her mom is the is the crazy parent thing. Yeah, she's kind of um, like Kristen Kirsten's mother in the last one, isn't she? It's kind of same energy. Yeah, we we got some serious demented parents here. Like all the parents are just wacky. They're all they've got this. They've got weird expectations of their children. Totally unrealistic expectations of their children. Or they just don't fucking understand the goddamn thing, which is also not helping. Typical Elm Street parents. Who else is in our crew here? Oh, of course the uh, our comic book boy. Yeah. Uh, whoa, 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 whoa. Joe Seeley? Is it Mark? Joe Seeley. Yes, that's Mark. Thank you. God only knows they scream his name enough. I should have fucking mm. remembered that. He was on one episode of SCTV. That's incredible. I'll make that two episodes. Wow. Uh, definitely a comedic actor. Yeah. I'd say. With a lot of snot in his head. He sounds very stuffed up. It's like, talks like this, man. <laughs> oh, help me blow by those, man. <laughs> so he was in... The same year as this, he was in. I had to look this up just because, um, oh, just because the title made me laugh. To be honest, because I'm a big child, apparently. Uh, Shag with uh, <laughs> also with uh, Phoebe Cates, Bridget Fonda, Scott Coffey. And, Wait a um, minute, what is? What do you mean, Shag? Like a shag carpet? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's also make. It's also uh, make the sex act here in America. That's what we say. Yeah, I, I like this guy. He's he's our he's our nerd. He's our comic book guy. I was nerding out over his stack of comics on the floor. Oh, it's amazing. And that whole like space he's in, I mean, it's uh, yeah. kind of want to uh, hang out in there. Oh, no, you don't, because it'll fall on you. Oh, shit, yeah. Um, I was wondering who did the arts. I was, like, wondering about... Oh, like in the comic? Yeah, it's it's pretty cool. Well, I'm wondering if, because it seems like Stephen Hopkins, uh, you know, sort of jumping ahead a bit to the um, behind the scenes, it's, it, they say he um, kind of came in with a very strong kind of sense of the art direction and have done these amazing drawings. So who knows? Maybe it was a few drawings of his his favorite character, the Phantom, whatever. Mm. The Phantom. The Phantom Prowler. Thank you. Oh my God, the Phantom Prowler. They look really stylish. Like they actually got like an actual marvel or dc artists to come in and do them i thought that was pretty cool yeah it's a kind of odd comic though i didn't spy a single word balloon in any of it it's kind of interesting <laughs> well hey it's a it's a visual medium brother <laughs> <laughs> that is true yeah it is it's very um uh but yeah i i love this crew i'm 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 there's just something about i feel like the nightmare on elm street movies got it yeah where if you like the characters you'll care what happens to them mm. And I know that a lot of people can't deal with slashers because there's so many unlikable pricks. And, and you know, the secret is to, to cast people that you like and, and make them likable characters, actually give them some dimension. And then when shit happens, it has the gravitas. And you're like, whoa, no, Greta, no. <laughs> I totally agree. And I kind of noted that on my last, uh, last viewing that it's like even, you know, very quickly, they just kind of establish themselves as being... Um, you know, just a very kind of close knit group, and it just feels very, um, you know, the kind of affection and the the banter and all that. You know, even within a few scenes, you're like, yeah, you know, it feels very uh, kind of authentic. Yeah, I like that. the 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 whole graduation sequence is really freaking cool. Yeah, yeah, very surreal. Um, this whole movie is is it's weird as shit. Oh god, yeah. I mean, even in the um, weird one, the credits like before that, you know, the um, you got a great uh, kind of. Even though, you know, it's kind of obvious it's going to come, but just how it's staged and everything, that kind of fake out uh, post, you know, waking up after the nightmare and all that. Um, I, I don't know what it is. It's a lot of, and there's some stuff we'll come to soon after this as well. Um, how a lot of it, again, in the filming, just how stuff is kind of blocked and staged and kind of revealed, you know, for kind of maximum impact. Um, just, yeah, totally on point. Everyone's posing for this photo. The the crew, the the five kids are, are posing, and you got the parents. And then there's this football scout. This coach from some fucking college is there to recruit Dan for college. And 
what the fuck is he doing there? <laughs> he totally just sits in. Fr- I'm gonna have to do a screenshot of this for the artwork. As part of the artwork for this episode, like I don't, I literally don't understand why this motherfucker is like, oh, I got to get in on this. I'm like, who are you, asshole? It makes this perfect scene stupid. Like it makes it a, just a little bonkers. Uh, but I love the gimmick was sunglasses, so everybody had weird looking sunglasses. Oh, with the eyes on them, the kind of um, oh, I can't think how to Alice's describe. have skull uh, skulls on them. Oh yeah, like his yeah. Little, I want a pair of sunglasses with little skulls on them. I bet yeah. eBay will hook a brother up. Hopefully they're big enough to fit on my big, dumb head. <laughs> you can't have a small head in podcast, folks. <laughs> if you know what I mean. Mm. <laughs> well, oh, boy. Very quickly, we find that Alice um, is screwed. Uh, <laughs> for some reason... <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, Freudian slurp. <laughs> wow. Alice is fucked in this movie literally before the credits are even over uh no uh alice is in trouble ha <laughs> she's also pregnant <laughs> i can't even start the sentence she's oh she's got a she's got a deal that uh, she's now dreaming while she's awake so she's slipping into the dream world losing time which i always find really interesting in movies so she she just drops into freddy's dream world and uh we get to see this amazing freaking matte painting. Holy shit of the freaking oh, lunatic boy. asylum. It, wow. <gasps> God, I, I just, man, like, I love when people gave a shit about making movies, dude. Yeah, and again, this was, um, although the DVD wasn't bad, but it's why watching this on the Blu-ray, you know, these first couple of times has been a real revelation. Like saying, again, that kind of strong sense of the uh, the art direction and all that. And just the, the visuals in general and the, the kind of craft. But um just before you, you see that and you're saying about how she's kind of sliding in and out of reality, and this is one thing, again, that really hit me this time, just how well everything kind of flows between these things, not just between the scenes, but even the shots. And after the graduation, when Alice is walking through the park, and again, it's like that fake out at the beginning. It's so brilliantly kind of revealed where she is like, you know, there's some people, I think, maybe in the park, and then she kind of moves and then just behind her head, just as the camera pans, you see all the, um, you know, the skipping uh, kids just sort of appear behind her. Like they've just been, I don't know how they did it exactly, but, you know, kind of nice bit of Beautiful. slide of hand there. Yeah, yeah, before um, then everything kind of gets dark and then before she sees the asylum and uh, you see, I think on the kind of periphery of the shot, you see the kind of um, shadows of the trees lengthening over and stuff. It's just, oh, it's so good. Man, love it. Love it. Uh, so it doesn't take long for uh, Freddy to make his entrance. Holy shit. <laughs> and uh, Freddy Krueger, man, he knows how to make a fucking entrance. Mm. Good Lord. Oh, we have this whole fantastic birth sequence that just, it reminded me of um, something like the creepy hospital shit from like Jacob's Ladder or oh, yeah, some yeah. other, like the, the whole thing where she's in this. The bowels of this freaking uh, insane asylum. Yeah, it's very uh, good call. I knew it reminded me of something. It's very hellish, kind of like, um, and I know this would kind of pinch a lot from uh, Jacob's Ladder, like Silent Hill or something like, you know. Ooh, yeah. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. Ooh, yeah. Ooh, yeah. And of course, there's the, 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 the lunatics, 100 lunatics, 100 maniacs, and the best one, of course, of all these out-of-work homeless people actors <laughs> yes. milling about. There's Freddy Krueger. Mm. There's good old uh, Robert England, just very unsubtly stealing the whole show. <laughs> yes. God, I love him. And of course, it takes me back to his terrifying performance of, of as Buck in Eaten Alive. Oh, boy. Yeah. He's got that leer, mm. that, that terrifying leer, which he perfected, of course. And you know, I found a little interview with uh, good old Fredward J. Krugertown himself. Uh, and I, I'm I'm loving that I keep finding interviews with... Robert England, where he slips in and out of talking like Freddy. He likes to take their own vocabulary and their own uh, favorite fads and throw them right back in their faces with a little bit of a violent curve on them. I mean, Freddy Krueger is the guy getting revenge on all those rich girls that tipped you off in high school, all those girls that thought your prom dress was shabby. And where'd you get that corsage, J.C. Penney's? You know, and Freddy's kicking butt there and sticking up. Not even that he sticks up for those kids, but he's exploiting Elm Street, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant white bread America. So we heard from uh, Mr. Mr. Kruger himself, 
uh, talking and, and of course going into character, which for some reason he's he was encouraged to do on camera by everyone who ever interviewed him about the Nightmare series. <laughs> I can do it. And you're like, why? Why, <laughs> why did you do that? I mean, it's great, but what? Why not? So he, he starts going after all, all of uh, Alice's wonderful friends. The death scene of her, her beau, Dan, right, you know, right before we find out that she's full of his babies. The, his death, mainly it's because of the music and it's over the topness, but that really feels like an Italian horror movie death yes, to me. Yes, and I'm glad you said that because I had this in my notes and I sort of second guessed it um, at first. Just saying it reminds me in parts, you know, giving me a slight Italian horror vibe. And then I was like second guessing it going because I had been watching some Italian horror thinking, is that just because, you know, there's some kind of bleed over in my brain? But I think I clocked <laughs> what it was uh, with the with the music. Uh, it reminds me a little bit, I think, of um, Pino Donaggio's music for The Sect. Oh, yes, it does. Good call. You know, kind of in parts. So, so the composer, uh, he's the elephant in my womb, Ooh. because we're talking about Dream Child. <laughs> wow. Oh, God. Uh, Jay Ferguson. So this dude did music for lots of freaking stuff. <laughs> Coincidentally, he did the music for Johnny Be Good. Oh. Which is a horrible, horrible teen comedy that I just fucking watched. Oh shit, yeah, I had no idea that existed. Oh jeez. Robert Downey Jr. and his cocaine fueled <laughs> refusal to do any of the fucking dialogue properly, and Anthony Michael Hall and an introducing Uma Thurman credit, so mm. Yeah, Lieta and I just experienced that. It's it sounds scary. a bit maybe like, um, well, I don't know whether it's comparable, but to probably my experience watching the fucking uh, Last American Virgin or something. It's definitely got some a popsicle feel. Oh, boy. Lemon popsicle people. <laughs> but, you know, it wasn't translated from another language. It wasn't <laughs> like, you know, this is Americans making hot garbage. <laughs> Uh, Jay Ferguson also did, we, we talked about Bad Dreams. We, we That keeps coming up. Yeah, yeah, I thought this was interesting. I have a feeling we're gonna, you and I are going to end up just covering that just because we want more Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah, I really need to watch them. Um, he did the music for Pulse, and I always get confused about which Pulse we're talking about. Mm -hmm. This is the one where the house is being taken over by electricity, by a killer hiding in the electricity. You know, this is crazy. Today, I have s spotted already so many movies that I have never even fucking heard of. That just I don't know whether it didn't get distributed on video in this country or what have you, but um, yeah, dude, make a list, make a list, and start watching sh weird shit. Yeah, definitely. Me. Yeah, uh, he did the music for License to Drive, uh, the the Co the Corey's movie, uh, <laughs> the skateboarding movie starring one Christian Slater called Gleaming the Cube. Ooh, that sounds uh, kind of obscene. I highly, <laughs> I'm in Shag and Gleaming the Cube. <laughs> Uh, looking at the cast list for um, Gleaming the Cube, <laughs> I, there's a guy called Richard Hurd, but my I read it as Richard Hart. <laughs> oh, you're dirty. Oh, dog. You're just you're just filthy. Yeah. Uh, he did the music for Tremors, the TV series. Mm. Does that mean? Does that mean he did Tremors the the movie or just that? I spotted one of the Tremors. So Tremors. You 4? did Tremors two. Oh, and Tremors two. There you go. And uh, my favorite movie from 1998 he did called The Sadness of Sex. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what that's about, but I'm clicking on it. Let's oh, see. Oh shit! Shit! This. Uh, oh wait, no. This is going to be a different one. I thought this uh, was a callback to uh, the last one, and this one called Driven, but it's not the Stallone movie you were talking about. <laughs> Dude, you'll be driven <laughs> from the theater. <laughs> anyway, we already did that. Oh, I will never forget that. We already did that. We already yeah. talked about that. Oh, my God. Oh, God. Classic. I saw that, too. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, one of the things is, um, for whatever reason, Nightmare on Elm Street 5 has a very special place in my heart for me picking out movie mistakes. Oh. And I was wondering why nobody had mentioned this movie mistake, why it doesn't come up. And uh, I swear this is related, I swear. Okay. The opening scene, we get um, freaking Alice after getting um, her Dan on, mm. uh, getting impregnated. 
Uh, she takes a shower, and it's this whole thing where they have a body double, a really obvious body double for the actress. And I would love to know if this body double is credited. Uh, I don't think she is. I'm sure there's something in the some of the trivia somewhere of who her body double is. I was watching it at home on cable, and they, of course, didn't have it in the prop, proper aspect ratio because this was, you know, the mid-90s when everything was full frame. There's a shot in the full frame. This is it's probably on the VHS tape where you can see the actress uh, Wilcox, uh, Lisa Wilcox. You can see she's wearing a bodysuit to cover up her nakedness. And I always thought this was such an annoying mistake, and it really drew, like just totally took me out of the movie. I was like, and I didn't need to see her naked. I knew they were using a body double. I just thought it was really bad that they'd done that. It was like a boom make, a boom mic mistake from the VHS days, mm. where once the movie's on DVD or Blu-ray in its proper aspect ratio, you can no longer see the mistake. They'll have done like, um, so I was noticed for The Shining, you know, on video, because uh, Kubrick did that thing, didn't he, where he'd like shoot at open map, but he was composing yep. for the, yeah, so, because um, yeah, I remember on video thinking, yeah, I can see the fucking helicopter at the beginning and uh yeah. you know this is kubrick how the hell would he miss that and it's like yeah you're not meant to see it of course years later yeah it's cropped properly um or just properly mm. okay. and so the the alternate versions of this movie are, are are twofold because you have this cable version i saw as a kid and of course that mistake is now lost to time then you have god this is a long way to get around to this uh <laughs> <laughs> then you have the freaking uh this gore sequence where we have two sequences that are much gorier on the old tape than they are on the new line DVD. Mm. And one of them is of course, Dan's death. They have uh, him getting turned into this motorcycle. So he goes through this whole thing where he gets the call from Alice at the party where they're celebrating, graduating at the pool. He jumps into his truck and goes off to see her and Freddy takes over because he falls asleep at the wheel, hmm. and yada, yada, yada. Next thing you know, he steals a motorcycle <laughs> after somehow surviving going through his own windshield. Yeah, and then he, because he's gone back to, and I love how that is almost like a callback to 4, how he's just completely fucked with and thrown back at the uh, the pool. Yes, and it's one of those things, dream logic, where you, you can go back to where you were, but everything's changed. Mm. Speaking of Kubrick and frickin', uh his his ultimate dream movie, freaking uh, oh Jesus! I have to look at my shelves. Eyes wide shut. Yeah, yeah. Duh. That whole thing where you can never go back to the same place twice. Of course, he doesn't have his keys now, so he has to get on this motorcycle. And of of course, it's a red motorcycle, which should have been a tip off, and gets mm. attached to the motorcycle. I also get an anime vibe from this sequence. Yeah, it's 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 kind of like, and this is crazy because this is a nineteen eighty nine movie as well, like um, yeah. Tetsuo. Something, or yeah. I suppose like Akira as well. Um, Akira, yeah. And mm. Man, that's all over the place. And he gets turned into this skeleton rider, and it's just, it's such a beautiful sequence. Mm. Uh, but I guess the, somebody wanted to make some cuts and a few, a few shots of these wires and pipes and yeah. exhaust yeah. thingies or whatever. I don't know how fucking motorcycles work. Stabbing him through the legs, and there was a lot of more blood seeping out of the engine and all this stuff. And it's like, this shit's crazy. Just fucking leave it in there, you goofballs. Yeah, you got to wonder. It's like shit for? the stuff that probably stayed in four, but they take that out. And is it like on some subconscious Freudian level, they don't like the idea of all these like shafts and wires penetrating the flesh or something? It could even but be it, that. But it's a guy, dude. We're not gay. <laughs> oh, no. We're not gay, bro. <laughs> no, I don't know what the fuck they're thinking. No. It's just like, it's just like the fucking Friday the 13th movies. Yeah. Where I'll I'll say this in defense of the censors for Friday the Thirteenth Part One, a couple of the things they cut look better in the cut version. Right when they released that Blu-ray that was the uncut Friday the Thirteenth, a couple of things should have stayed cut. Oh, like right. a couple of just split seconds where you can see Tom Savini, you know the, the oh, things yeah, Tom yeah. Savini yeah. did. So I wish I still owned my old Friday the Thirteenth DVD just because it looks better. Mm. But then you have all this other effects work that these people worked so fucking hard to bring about and make happen and of course they were betting on being censored so they made the movies as gory as possible to one up each other yeah that way there'd yeah. be something left and you still can't get those scenes because all those cans of footage are fucking lost presumably oh, it's terrible 
crazy. At least you can find all the gore. It's like this. You you told me, hey, this this stuff is on YouTube, and after the movie was over, I immediately watched it. And with Yvonne's death, it fucking shit doesn't make sense with that with the cuts. Fuck. I mean, we're gonna talk about that in a moment now, but it's like, give me a break. <laughs> it's like we're, it's two thousand four people. <laughs> It's it's 1996. Can we at least get these things on Laserdisc uncensored, yeah. you fuckers? I tell my students that work for me that uh, I think that it's still the 90s. I'm like, it's 1998, people. Can we get a new version of Adobe Acrobat? Fuck. Acrobat. Fuck. Um, there's a funny part where um, Mark and Yvonne don't believe Alice. Mm. It's like, guys, this lady's been to Wonderland, yo. Mm -hmm. Word up, literature reference. <laughs> no. Uh, Alice, you know, she, her friends just don't know her history. It's so mm. cute. And, and so the, she has to reteach everyone, the audience included, about who Freddy Krueger is, uh, which luckily it doesn't take very long. And then <laughs> Mark has to experience almost falling down uh, Freddy Krueger's urethra or whatever. Oh boy! Oh, yeah, we'll come that, to that. Is that some, Freddy Krueger's uh... butthole? Or, <laughs> or, I know it's. I guys. I guess it's supposed to be a birth canal. So now that we're dealing with dr dream babies, there's some. And I suppose I may as well bring this up now before I forget. Um, some comments in one of the featurettes from the Blu-ray made me laugh from uh, Rachel Talalay, who we talked about before, who will uh, direct the next film. But she, at this point, after doing, like, you know, the previous two, she's just, like, completely burnt out. And I think she was going on to do uh, Crybaby, so that John Waters movie, at the same time. So, yeah, Ooh. but she, she has some comments about it where... Um, no, this can't be right. I've written this down wrong. Sorry. Dropping the ball here. Vagina-like tombs. That can't be right. Or wombs? That sounds good to me. Yeah. Moon tombs. <laughs> Ask the VHS tape. Or tunnels, maybe. Anyway, this next bit I know I've got right because this at least makes sense. It says, I think you should talk to all the male directors about their womb obsessions and the, the writers by proxy, I suppose. That's just because they're not gay, brother. <laughs> yeah. no. Hey, they're just proving their masculinity, man. They are unsmashing the patriarchy. If anything, <laughs> um, they're lubing it up and showing it off. <laughs> Hey, Macarena. I I don't know why I just did that. Because <laughs> you're stuck in the 90s. <laughs> That's it. I'm stuck. Please help. Now we get the weirdest part about this movie that it's really, really hard to reconcile. Mm. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say my thought and then I'm going to sing a little bit. So bear with me, Simon. Okay. Here we go. Here's my thought. Hey, this is a pro-choice movie. And, and here comes <laughs> me singing. Papa, don't preach. <laughs> I'm in trouble deep. Papa, don't preach. Freddy's my baby daddy kind of uncle. No. So <laughs> this movie's pro-choice in that Alice has a choice. She wants to keep her child. You know, Mark's like, hey, let's abort this thing and, you know, like literally stop the whole movie right here. Mm. But she's like, no, I want to keep the child. So she's making a choice. Of course, this movie is also pro-life because she <laughs> wants to keep the kid and not let Dan's shithead parents adopt it. Mm. But yeah, dude, like, that's a little weird. This is very, it seems like a very conservative film. Mm. Um, I mean, mm. her dad is, 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 he's not ashamed of her being knocked up. Nah, he's not Seth Rogen. He's <laughs> Seth Rogen's dad. Jo no, Joe Rogen. She's, she's Joe <laughs> Rogen's future dad. I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I don't know what to make of this. I mean, I, I'm glad that, I mean, I wish I was aborted before I was born. Um, it would spare me the pain of, of, of this, because I think I'd rather be in purgatory, although I live in Tampa, Florida, so it's sort of a purgatory in and of itself. Hmm. Simon, high five. High five. All right. Whoops, whoops. I wish I was aborted, too. <laughs> so what do you make of this? I don't know. Um, I think he was just trying to be helpful, I guess. Um, and it is, it is like you say, it is, I suppose, like pro-choice. And then he's, he's just going to throw it out there. And then when it's like, yeah, you know, because, of course, you know, uh, Dan is now dead and all that. And it's kind of, um, you know, just part of her, part of him. And he, he seems, you know, he, as soon as she says, you know, I'm keeping it. You know, she's very clearly made a mind up. He's very supportive. And I don't, I don't know beyond that. I thought, oh, well, that's nice. And I didn't really think of it again, to be honest. <laughs> that's all I think about. Fair enough. So Greta's death, um, 
the because it got so cut up by the censors for the, just the DVD version and not the old VHS tape, the unrated, I guess, VHS version. Mm. Um, her death doesn't make any fucking sense now. Mm. They don't show the shot at all of Freddy cutting into her stomach. Yeah. It implies it because he sort of goes to cut into the doll, but they even cut him because her whole thing is dolls. Mm. Mm. And she's like her mother's little doll. And, and she, d- so he cuts open the doll and is feeding her the guts and the heart of his doll. And they cut that. So I don't even know what he's doing. And then. He's literally feeding her guts in the line, you are what you eat. And they cut it so much on this DVD that you don't even know what the fuck he's talking about. But they even show a shot from her broken open rib cage and stomach up at her face as it's getting more and more disgustingly stuffed with uh, delicious looking food. Mmm. Mmm, hungry. A good scene to watch while you're eating porridge or something. <laughs> oh, boy, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so I, I just I just don't understand why the fuck they cut that shit. It's awful. Mm, mm, it's a shame. Um, we need to get to the most important sequence of any film, which is Freddy Krueger on a skateboard. <laughs> yeah. Hang ten, dude. Ride the curl. <laughs> Some ripping waves on my skateboard. Totally tubular. <laughs> He's totally rad. My God, I God, gleaming the cube, everybody, <laughs> gleaming the cube. So. <laughs> My note just made my me laugh. I'm such a fucking idiot. So, oh boy. so okay. So before I I reveal what stupid thing I wrote down made me laugh just now. Mm. Uh, Freddy Krueger goes after Mark, and it's very imaginative, uh, very fun. It's he, you know he's in black and white. They do this great grayscale Freddy. It's like they were predicting all the massive amounts of toys you could buy. I'm sure someone has made grayscale Freddy, or you could buy you could buy a Super Freddy on a freaking you know, because he, he he battles Mark. Mark turns into the Phantom, the Phantom Strangler, Phantom Prowler, hmm. the Phantom uh, Voyeur Masturbator. I forget. <laughs> he has very impractical guns on his costume that are attached to these like weird, like weird holsters, like yeah, like, his mechanical arms. It's like very some kind of like steampunk, like pirate sort yeah. of highwayman or some shit. I don't know. I'm sure. I'm sure the character was represented in. Uh, by Rob Liefeld or something later. There's a, there's a comic book joke for you. Uh, it was barely a comic book joke. Uh, he turns into Super Freddy. And Super Freddy uh, is this massive, massive actor. Michael Bailey Smith played Super Freddy. And uh, this is an actor, very, very busy man. Uh, 101 credits, including the Hills Have Eyes remake. Uh, Men in Black 2. Uh, the Hills Have Eyes 2, that one. He, so he... He plays a giant named Pluto in that. Mm. But yeah, dude, lots of stuff. Mm. Um, he was in the Hong Kong movie uh, Black Mask 2, directed by good old uh, Sui Hark. Yeah, just he's just a, a giant behemoth of a man. He's in Cyborg 3, the Recycler. <laughs> what is this? Oh my god, oh, Malcolm McDowell. Holy shit. Prepare yourself for the all-too-deadly future. <laughs> Cash, the heroine of Cyborg 2, is living safe in the free zone, but not for long. Oh, Christ. Biomechanical problems are taking her system, or taking down her systems in a visit to a doctor, and Silica confirms her worst fears. She is more than a marvel of cyborg technology. She is the first of her kind to be a creator. She is pregnant. Whoa, it's just like this movie. What? This is, uh, <laughs> this is, fuck, dude. I don't, I want to watch the cyborg because I love cyborg. Mm. I, oh my God. Christine Haje is the titular cyborg woman. You've got Zach Galligan, Richard Link. Yeah, interesting. Good times. She was in head of the class. Oh my God. She was in head of the class. <laughs> I love this, just thinking, you know, we're kind of lost down the kind of uh, Freddy's butthole tunnels of IMDb. <laughs> you and I would be one of those people who, given the the amount of time, like if we if we were gainfully not employed, like we were rich people, mm. we would just have VHS player and old TV and a stack of every one of these fucking movies, <laughs> direct to video, schlockaroo. Oh, yeah. But, uh... I forget what I was even talking about. I think that Nightmare 5 is what will be the most graphic in terms of design 
of all the nightmare films. And I think it's also the most non-linear. Um, if I had to describe it, I would call it a sort of a hallucinatory uh, Freddy meets Rosemary's baby. Remember when your parents told you that comic books were bad for you? Remember that? They were right. <laughs> In the trivia, you no you noticed the most amazing trivia that four out of six people think that uh, Mark's death is the most saddest, <laughs> most depressing. It's like the cr Freddy's cruelest kill. I'm like, sure. It's, uh, it's, it's mean. It's Freddy a saddest, is he? Yeah, he's a saddest. <laughs> yeah. Sad days. Uh, <laughs> so my joke that I wanted to make, so I made my notes laugh, is uh, so Freddy Krueger, son of a hundred maniacs, is the best episodes of my one hundred dads ever. <laughs> so <laughs> cue the my two dads theme right here. That's that made me laugh out loud. That made me lol out loud at my own stupid. Fucking my dude, joke. my two dads. I'd completely forgotten about that. Oh, oh my God. lord. She dots these eyes with these little hearts. Isn't that great? This fall, Paul Reiser and Greg Evigan are my two dads. Real father and daughter stuff, you know? So we get the creepy kid. We get Jacob. Mm. He probably auditioned for a lot of cereal commercials, and they said, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> we want to actually sell this cereal. So what in the world? Oh, uh, uh, Whit Herford? As Whitby Herford? Yeah, oh, that's him. Wow. There he is. He's grown into his, his anime eyes. <laughs> Sort of. Has. Wow. What a weird looking dude. No offense to him. I'm fucking ugly as sin. He so is. He's striking. I'll give it that. Oh my god. He was on Full House at some point. Good for him. Nice mm -hmm. work if you can get it. I'll be there for you. It's not the theme song to Full House. <laughs> Paul Geist 2. Kane's People. Yeah, he's one of, he's, he's, he, he played all of Kane's People. Frederick von Krugenberger, a.k.a. Freddy Krueger, he's the uncle dad of the year. He's trying to get uh, Jacob to, to be evil and feeding him the souls of uh, Alice's friends, which is weird because all of the weird tubing, apparently, that's inside women that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> what? Like the fallopian tube or the, the what's the thing that goes in your belly button? The, the cord? The like what? fucking hell mouth or something. But, um, oh, the umbilical. Thank you. <laughs> I'm really into women's bodies, bro. That's why I, everything I build is Freddy's urethra. I mean, a, a womb tunnel, yeah. He's, he's teaching him, and then, of course, Jacob is a good boy, and Alice enlists his help to defeat Freddy, and so he uses his powers to make giant fleshy sperm monsters shoot out of Freddy's back. So there's a lot of, like, weird... You know, like, forget the woman imagery. There's always sperm imagery in these fucking movies, mm. which uh, we don't have as much, uh, like, weird lightning shooting out of people, like the weird powers. Like, when Alice was absorbing the powers, it's less like that and more just weird sperm heads with her friends' heads on them. Yeah, yeah it makes sense, all the kind of, like, body horror and stuff in this, I suppose. <sighs> I guess this is like the turning point of the Nightmare series where things begin to go down. I know yeah. a lot of people think, you know, this is the the last good one, quote unquote. You know, I know people love Seven, but we'll talk about that when we talk about that. Because everyone fucking rags on Six so much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But what was going on? I mean, I feel like they're, they're, they're pulling out all the stops and suffering from burnout at the same time. I think that's it. I mean, apparently they had the kind of least turnaround time as well to do this. So oh my least... god, yes. Good call. It's They had four weeks to shoot it? And it was in some kind of insane heat wave as well. Um, oh, those poor bastards. Yeah. Poor Robert England. Oh, jeez. Yeah, it's like they're in this sort of, um, I don't know, warehouse or something with no ventilation, no windows in California. It's like over 100 degrees. Dude, California, what? No, these take place in middle America. How dare you? <laughs> How dare you? Whoops. I don't want to use my imagination. Well, too late. No, oh, fuck. All I can think of is sperm monsters, anyway. <laughs> Obviously, I will talk about how we feel about this movie, but, I mean, mm. things don't feel like they're slowing down to me, and it's only oh, in no. retrospect. no. How long between this and part six do we have? Uh, like eight, two years, I think. Yeah, so they took a little break, sort of, not really. They Hopefully they gave them more time to come up with all of the wonders of part six. <laughs> uh, there's a great Twin Peaks moment, speaking of how we can never fucking get the fuck out of Twin Peaks. Oh, right. 
So once uh, Freddy is defeated, spoiler alert, oh my god, temporarily defeated, uh, there's a moment where his, his mom, which, god, we haven't even talked about the nuns, our nun character, Freddy's oh, yeah. mom, Amanda mm-hmm. Kruger, desperately seeking nuns. <laughs> uh, so Freddy gets defeated, and she takes Freddy's uh, fetus back into her, and then uh, Amanda is given baby Jacob, and Jacob turns into white light and gets absorbed back into her tummy. And I swear... I thought of you when that scene happened with all the white light and the, mm. I was like, man, if they just play a little Angelo Badalamenti over this part. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if yeah. you'd done the soundtrack for this one, you would have been like, Urgh. definitely. Yeah, I hear what you say. Nice. <laughs> oh, it's so great. I love that shit. The Nun. Uh, uh, Amanda Kruger, played by someone named Beatrice Bopel. Mm. That is an awesome name. Hi, I'm Beatrice Bopel. I'm a Bactress. <laughs> I'll be bite back. Gotta go take a bis. Gotta go boop in the toilet. In the toilet. <laughs> I don't know the fuck I'm talking about. <laughs> she played a nun in another movie. That's incredible. Oh. She played a nun in something called Shoot to Kill. Oh, yeah. I like Shoot to Kill. That's uh, 88, directed by Roger Spottiswood. Oh, um, right. I was... Sydney Poitier. What the fuck? And I even clicked on this. So, like, without. Time yeah, no, it, was, it was a different yeah. title, Deadly Pursuit, and it said none underneath. I didn't even look. What the mm-hmm. fuck? And Kirstie Alley. Yeah. Oh, my God. Kirstie Alley is so cute in that movie. Oh, my God. But, uh, yeah, Shoot to Kill is one of those films that I. I it has a tone to it that's really unique. Mm. It's it's something about it. It's, it's, it's your standard action y movie, but I can't really place why it's so good. And it's like. Um, our director, uh, our director Stephen Hopkins, his first film, it just is really memorable years and years and years later. Mm. I don't know what else Roger Spottiswood did? Oh, he's done all sorts. He had a very interesting career. He did, he did, he did, he did, he did, he did Terror Train. He did, I know he did oh my God. Tomorrow Never Dies, like years later. What uh, the fuck? And uh, maybe most importantly, unless I've um, misremembered this, I'm pretty sure he did. Let me check. Yep, Stop or My Mum Will Shoot. Oh. <laughs> Man, <laughs> stop or my mom will shit all over the house. That movie, oh my god, I actually saw that on video with my parents, and we oh, were all like, boy. well, we saw that. Yeah, Amazing. it's... Uh, yeah, it, it, was a, it was a movie. But, uh, and genitals. <laughs> exactly. And uh, The Sixth Day as well, which is yeah, a much better movie. I've still never seen that. That's a, a Arnie movie, right? It is, yeah, it's all right, you know. Oh, gosh. Is this Jerry calling for Jerry again? We had a call before we started here, folks. Let's see. Hello? Mama. Mama. Mama, help me. There we go. <laughs> I hope there was someone on the other line. Me too. So here's a movie that um, I don't even know how I got to. Okay, so <laughs> please help. Uh, some So Beatrice Bopel... <laughs> Was in a movie called Matinee, but not the one you're thinking of. Mm. It was a TV movie from a country called Canada. Not mm. sure if I've heard of that one. A small, comma, depressed Canadian town is about to relive its tragic past when a popular movie director comes to town, dash, but who is the killer, question mark. Mm. That sounds great. I'm going to leave that window open so I can go find that. Yeah. Matinee, 1989. Sounds cool. Anyway, it's probably terrible. Uh, but at least it's got people going a boot. Well, and it has uh, flipping Donis Davis again from Twin Peaks in it. So, uh, you know, ah. can't be a complete waste of time. Ah. Ah. <laughs> I'm just going to start screaming every time we find more Twin Peaks things. <laughs> till I'm just in the gibbering madman. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. Twin Peaks is everywhere. Oh, yeah, that's so, it. David Lynch, he's, he's been fucking with the timelines again, honey. Liette always says that Anthony Hopkins is inside of every woman, but I think David Lynch is inside of every man. Yeah. I still don't know what she meant by that, and I've known her for a few years now. <laughs> we'll get her on the show and ask her about it. Definitely. Long story short, too late. No no tangents. Way too late for that. Mm. Uh, Freddy gets defeated, and uh, we get this sequence at the end, because like, they couldn't leave well enough alone. Uh, where it's Yvonne, who actually survives, mm. believe it or not. She saves the day. Who would have thought? Yeah, I, I, I love this. And then especially, um, even though it's like, you know, two second kind of moment where she, I guess, frees Amanda. And she says, yep. thank you. You know, it's such a kind of striking, kind of almost like haunting image. 
You know, how she's kind of like half ghostly, half like decayed corpse or something. Yes, she died doing what she loves, praying Mm. to Jesus. Yeah. It's her, and of course, Alice's dad is there, and and, uh, baby uh, Jacob has now transmogrified into into baby Dan. She just named him Dan. Ah. Her dad goes, is somebody hungry? And she looks at the baby and says, oh, yeah, I think so. Then he takes out a, a blanket at the park. He takes a lays out a picnic blanket and then takes two Mountain Dews and a Pepsi. <laughs> yes, and I'm like, how many fucking Mountain Dews is this baby going to drink? <laughs> what the fuck? Uh, and I, I just happen to know people who have had children recently. Mm. And you got to wait a long fucking time. If you're still breastfeeding, you can't have caffeine, <laughs> especially not the likes of which you get from Pepsi or Mountain Dew. <laughs> Like, what is this, Joan Crawford frickin' sponsored this movie? <laughs> what the fuck is going on here? We get the, we get the ending where everything's hunky-dory, and once again, totally unsubtle, slap in the face with the one, two, Freddy's coming for you girls, doing mm. the jump rope in, and I'm like, okay, they ran out of ideas for how to give us a clue that it's not yeah. quite over yet. Yeah, they've come full circle, haven't they, to the, yes. uh, the original again. Let's talk about some of this crew. Uh, we have a, a writer named Leslie Bohem, who wrote this bad boy. He wrote the horror show. Was he involved in part four? Is that why I'm like, what? No, he wasn't. No, he wasn't involved in part four. Uh, but he wrote 20 bucks. Okay. 20 bucks from 1993. <laughs> about a $20 bill that weaves in and out of the lives of several people, which, how ah, the fuck have I seen that? Oh, my God. <laughs> I'll tell you what, having stolen cable back in the day, you just watched fucking everything. Shout out to my parents. They taught me good lessons in life. (laughs) Uh, The cinematographer on this film was Mr. Peter Levy, or Miss Peter Levy. I'm not going to judge. But uh, he's Australian, and he shot uh, Big Shocker. Uh, He shot Dangerous Game, which so and he shot freaking Predator 2, so he kind of stuck with... uh, our director here. Cool. Well, yeah, mad props to him, you know, by, by proxy for this, like I say, just really, um, yeah, like I said before, this really all flows so well together, which helps not just with the kind of transitions between all the dreams and reality, but just with that, like I say, that sense of momentum this film has, you know. And, this and kind of honestly, you are convincing me to uh, freaking upgrade to the Blu-rays, man. I feel mm, like, do it. I mean, I'm not one of those people that has to replace every single movie I own. God forbid. I, I have to put on a second mortgage on my house Oh yeah, to freaking buy every Blu-ray I wanted. But this is just more and more, especially the first five films, I feel like I've done myself a disservice by sticking with the old cheap garbage uh, new line box set, which doesn't have any of the extras. Oh, it doesn't even have any of the fucking extras at all. I mean, I mean, I haven't seen the discs for Part Seven and uh, Freddy vs. Jason yet, but I'm guessing there's no audio commentaries on any of them either. I don't think, except for maybe the first film. Mm. I'm not sure. Mm. I think I'm just got. I think I just got screwed. <clears throat> so I'll I'll upgrade. I'll upgrade. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd say it's worth doing again with any of these where you've got lots of color and lots of great kind of production design detail and all of that. Yeah. Speaking of production design, we're sticking with our pal C.J. Strawn here. Uh, he was production designer on one through six. Oh no, I'm sorry. No, he was he was production designer on four, five, and six. Ah, right. Okay, yeah, yeah. So that's why that's why four and five feel so mm. connected. Mm. Mm. He's also production designer on a movie we talked about recently as well, The Hidden. Oh, Good cool. Old, uh, Twin ah, Peaksy, yeah. Kyle McLeeksy. Yeah, I think that's a that's probably a new line film that, so that makes it. Ah, yeah, Jack Shoulder, I said directed that. New line, big shocker there. Mm. <laughs> so trivia. Um two guys that, that contributed to the screenplay, but apparently had everything they contributed fucking cut out except for the idea of uh something i forget sorry i think it was the the baby idea you know because yeah. because uh you know they as it's kind of talked about in the the uh the script by the doctor and you know babies you know spending their entire time in this kind of uh dream state yeah i thought that would be a kind of good way to go um and they did they that's a that's like the key of the plot here mm, mm. uh but it's john skip and craig specter have you read any of their horror novels no well, they work together or Yes, uh, John Skip and Craig Spector, um, they were two guys. They always wrote together in the beginning. Eventually, their partnership kind of dissolved, mm. but uh, they were kind of responsible for the splatterpunk movement oh, in, right, in uh, yeah. horror fiction. So uh, I'm sure someone else 
listening to this show is probably screaming at me that no, they were just part of it. But I really think they were, for my money, they were instrumental in making the idea of splatterpunk into something that, you know, even a, a dumb kid like me in the in the eighties was aware of. Yeah. Uh and they wrote some books that are just fucking outstanding. Mm. Uh let me pull up I'll just cute for folks who haven't heard of them, a few titles. Uh Hello Wikipedia. Well they wrote the novelization of Fright Night, which um I'd love to read that based mm. on their style. Uh but I can recommend The Light at the End. It's one of the best vampire books ever written. Mm. I think I read The Scream. No, I definitely read The Scream. The Scream fucking terrified me as a kid. Um, it's about evil rock and roll. So they, they took that whole concept of how everyone is scared of, of heavy metal and the satanic panic and said, well, what if, what if the band really was Satanists and they mm. really were like invoking demons? It's a great book. Totally insane. Cool. Um, I also read The Cleanup, which was really good. So far, I, I think I've only read those four or three, and they are all excellent. Really, just fascinating writers. Cool, yeah. I'll keep um, that yeah, up. look up that splatterpunk movement too. That there's, 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 that was a crazy time. That was a yeah, crazy time to be. I don't know if read any of it. I think in some of the anthologies I've got, that some of the writers have come up. I mean, yeah, I suppose oh, yeah. yeah. Clyde Barker's kind of included. Was his David mm-hmm. J. Show and um, a few others. Yeah. Uh, there's a great book, of course, uh, folks. If you haven't read this book, get off your butt and read it paperbacks from hell mm. uh that reinvigorated my because i got really bad about reading horror fiction i didn't read horror fiction for a decade or more my wife got me paperbacks from hell and now i can't i read it all the way through i'm gonna read it all the way again and it turned me on to a lot of horror novels i didn't even know existed cool so before we just really stretch out this part five for <laughs> eternity apparently <laughs> this was our favorite film here. <laughs> oh Simon, um, how do you feel about uh, good old Nightmare on Elm Street Part 5, The Revenge of Freddy's Sperm? Well, uh, a bit of kind of back history. In the past, this was one that I kind of used to sort of grit my teeth through a bit. There were parts I liked, but I I found it kind of trying. But I'd I'd like it a little bit more, sort of, each time. I've not seen this a tremendous amount of times. And then I got the Blu-ray, which I've only watched twice. And that, like, first viewing, like I said, that was very much a revelation. And uh, when I watched it again the other night, yeah, even more so again, especially because I was really kind of focusing on the movie and just really um trying to appreciate it properly i suppose so maybe i even love it now i don't know um i think the thing that used to throw me off was i think the kid annoyed the living piss out of me but i maybe yeah. i was just in a bad mood and now i don't now i kind of wonder what my problem even was so <laughs> yeah yeah definitely uh yeah this is um this is kind of getting up there maybe um although we'll see when i rewatch um freddy's dead you know maybe this has kind of overtaken that you know, which might to some people might be you're like, yeah, that's damning with faint praise. But I really kind of loved and do do love uh, Freddy's Dead. So, um, yeah, yeah. Interesting. This might have overtaken that. Very cool. Yeah, I'm loving this one. Like uh, this. This is one I like you. I, I thought it was really bad. I think my viewing of it on on cable TV did not do it any service mm. at all. Mm. I, and it's it's funny, like um, as we talked about one three and four are the ones I've seen the most Mm. from my kid days and five. I remember the production stuff. I remember it being hyped a lot and then I never actually sat down to watch it until it was on cable in the nineties and yeah, revisiting it now, (laughs) just like you, the kid doesn't bother me anymore. Uh, the, the, the the dream child stuff was maybe I thought was really cheesy, but now it fits perfectly, especially with, with the continuity of the series really just keeping up at mm, this point. Mm. Um, I love that they managed to have a character come back for frickin' what's her face and her dad for like three movies. Was Alice introduced in three or was Alice introduced in four? Oh, yeah, yeah, Alice is in uh, four and five. And I guess because it's that kind of literally as I can pass on the battle. Alice in four. You know, so the, is that kind of overlap, like, so to speak? Yeah, thank you, sir. I'm really glad we're doing this because it's really. It's fun to finally sit down and really, really take these in mm, mm. And, and and just really like get all silly. It's like when, when Brad and I did the Halloween series on an, an episode years ago mm-hmm. where we did all the Halloween uh, movies where I'm just seeing shit that I'm like, what? Yeah. Like, what? How did I, how did I not 
pay attention to that, this, that, or the other thing and everything. So yeah, yeah. five is yeah. great. So, so Simon, you and I, we are moving on to, uh, Freddy's dead, which is the last film they ever made with containing Freddy Krueger. <laughs> Cause they killed the character that said, fuck money. Mm. Fuck it. The final chapter. Yeah. <laughs> Folks, here is the teaser trailer for Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare, a.k.a. the one with the 3D. Welcome to a brand new nightmare. Great to be back in business. The Final Nightmare. Uh, Did you mind your girlfriend? I won't tell. <laughs> this is my favorite. It's got to be me and him. We're going to have to hit him with everything I've got. Cool. Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare. They saved the best for last. Rated R. Starts Friday, September 13th at a theater near you. That was the teaser trailer for the world's greatest part six in any series, Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare, released in 1991. <sighs> I have a feeling we will be... I will have less to say about this one. I mean, we really... We went on a tear on part five there. Yeah, I mean that you know it was it was again kind of surprising for me to go back just how uh, much it went up in my estimation. So yeah, it was really um, I, I'd always kind of dug it, and I you know watching it again last night, I you know I, I like it more than more and more. So yeah, it's not had the same you know the the, the kind of spike in interest that I suppose Five had. It's been more of kind of a, a, a flat or steady sort of incline. You know what I mean? Yeah, and uh, this is a fan favorite. No, like, dude, <laughs> people fucking hate this movie. Like, there's people that oh, maybe yeah. out there who love it, but uh, yeah, people are, are pretty down on uh, this one. Uh, this is uh, director Rachel Talalay, and uh, she would go on after this uh, to direct a, a little horror film in 1993, a techno thriller called Ghost in the Machine, mm -hmm. which uh, is one of those movies that I, I haven't seen but it's very, very um, dated the day it came out with its technology. I know that much about it. I should probably give it a watch sometime. And then she did Tank Girl in 1995, which uh, if you've seen Tank Girl without ever having picked up one of the comics, you might enjoy it. Mm. Whereas if you're, if you're me in the 90s and you tore through the comics and were like, holy shit, this is going to be great. And then you saw the movie and you went, huh. Hmm. Well, hmm. I don't know if you have an opinion on Tank Girl or not. I, I saw it once, like, years ago. I think it was one of these cases of, you know, you you rounded a friend's house or what have you, and, you know, it's just kind of on in the background. And it, it was okay, but it, it left really no impact on me at all, to be honest. Um, but, uh, yeah, since then, she's... I don't know if she's done any feature films since then. It seems to be... Just television. Pretty much TV, including... I, oh God, I've not seen this for years. There's a uh, TV movie of The Wind in the Willows from 2006. I remember watching one Christmas and quite liking. Um, I oh, had wow. no idea she directed that. So that's interesting. Um, I wonder if that's how she met... Uh, Mark Gatiss is in that, and she would, you know, amongst, like, say, you see her TV credits, and especially more recent times, it's, you know, some of the stuff she's done, like, God, you know, like Doctor Who, Sherlock. Oh, yeah, yeah, like I said to you, yeah, Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, uh, one episode of that, uh, The Flash, Doom nice. Patrol, American Gods, uh, Riverdale. Oh, and wow. she is, uh, looks like she is doing another feature now. What's this? A Babysitter's Guide to Monster Hunting. What the heck is this that's in... Uh, pre-production that oh. sounds good to me yeah yeah so working steadily she definitely she's no slacker oh no uh, she also co-wrote this uh this movie with uh someone named michael de luca and michael de luca one of his credits has stuck out one of his executive producer credits uh, uh was he he was an executive producer on leatherface texas chainsaw massacre 3 so he knows about troubled productions, although ah. I don't think this one had a troubled production. No, for the most part. I mean, I think there was a bit of, um, we can get into it later, with the with the 3D. You know, I think that was seen as a bit of a pain <laughs> in the ass, but, but oh yeah, my that's going to be part of the cause with 3D, really. A pain in the eyes. Brian May's music for this movie. So Brian May, not bad. Not bad at all. Great composer. Uh, Mad Max, uh, Road Warrior... Gallipoli, I mean, like, like huge movies, huge. 
Um, I really don't know if he showed up for this one. Well, I mean, maybe he sent an intern over or something. Because some of the music in this, the soundtrack, the songs, <laughs> they're all shit. Hmm. But the, the 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 actual score for this, if you even notice it, is either boring or bad. It's okay. It, it works. It's not like, I mean, you know, going back to say like the first four, um, maybe even, oh yeah, five a bit because you know, we, it was kind of had an interesting score, didn't it? Uh, yeah. it, it it's all right. It doesn't really bother me, you know, like, um, God, I remember the first time, I don't know whether I was just really tired or something. The first time I watched uh, Mad Max and the film drove me a bit bonkers, to be honest, especially the music. Uh, I think when I went back and rewatched <laughs> it, not so much. So maybe I was just in a weird mood, but I just remember the first time I watched it just being like, yeah, the, the music is, I, I fucking hate this. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, he also did the legendary score, everyone's favorite for Dr. Giggles. Ah, yeah. No, it's a Brad favorite, isn't it? I need to watch that. I don't remember the music from it, but uh, yeah, Dr. Giggles is wonderful. That was one of those movies I thought I'd seen, and I saw I just was like, eh, whatever. And then years, years later, I bought the box set that comes with It and a few other, not It. Now we can't even say the word It without mentioning It. No <laughs> Stephen King. I can't wait to watch that again. That's a fun movie. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> fun. <laughs> fun. So yeah, yeah. So obviously I'm not a big fan of the music. But one thing I do like about this movie is that it's a grunge movie. Yes. Nirvana hadn't quite taken over the world when this came out, but they were right there. So radio was kind of confused. And I think Hollywood was confused. So they just grabbed a bunch of fucking random sort of grungy sounding artists. Yeah. And then you've got like the odd like hip hop and uh, sort of dance numbers as well, which again, yes. it's all it's very, very 1991. So I'm just looking. So I was curious. Uh, Google's albums in 1991 so yeah never mind um you know uh rem album um metallica one my bloody valentine Red <laughs> chili peppers guns and roses oh yeah pearl jam oh Soundgarden, of course so yeah very much it's yeah grunge just about to flip and take over the world for a few years so I i'm looking at the uh the soundtrack here <laughs> uh we got uh, Why Was I Born, the Freddy's Dead song, which is great by Iggy Pop. Yeah, I really like that. Yeah. It's fun. I, I love I love how consistent this series is with getting people to come in and record songs for the movie. That's so great. Uh, then we have three tracks by the Goo Goo Dolls. Oh, so, so right. Something yep. we've actually heard of. Two songs by someone named Johnny Law, courtesy of Metal Blade Records. <laughs> Wow, Goo Goo Dolls were on Metal Blade Records. That's bizarre. The what? 90s were a confusing time for everyone. Oh, God. And yeah. then uh, <laughs> we got someone called the Junk Monkeys. <laughs> Young Lords. Chub Rock. Oh, my God. And okay, so this makes sense. Speaking of Metal Blade Records, Fate's Warning. So an actual metal band. And of course, the the for the, our beautiful drug sequence, we got good old Iron Butterfly, which I'm so glad they could afford that song for that sequence. But we'll get to that when we get to that. Yeah. Uh, so the movie has uh, some some rockin' intro. Um, I started to write sounds like Queensrÿche, but then when the song kicked in, I I inserted the word shitty, so it sounds like shitty Queensrÿche. <laughs> but then I wrote or grunge. The more the song unfolded, and then I wrote grunge movie. Uh, we get our, our, our rockin' credits. We get some frickin' huge, like, proper credits, like, Freddy's dead! Rawr. Oh, yeah. And we get a quote from Nietzsche. <laughs> what? Why? I don't know whether I still have this. I thought I screen capped it a while back. I don't know if I've kept it. Let me see. Freddy's dead. Nietzsche. I still don't know if I'm saying his name right. Here it is. Ooh, I'm getting an ad for Arnold Palmer spiked lemonade. <laughs> Ooh. Do you know the terror of he who falls asleep? To the very toes he is terrified because the ground gives way under him and the dream begins. Frederick Nietzsche. And then more hilarity ensues with the uh, title cards that explain that this is 10 years in the future. They show like a map of America, like a computer generated map of America. And we see that the children are all dead and it drove everybody in Springwood crazy. 
mass psychosis. I don't know whether it was Freddy who did that or just because this is meant to be 1999, apparently, whether it was just like 10 years of grunge. That's what's kind of... uh... (laughs) 10 years of people still playing Ninja Gaiden on one of those handheld things. So technology (laughs) stopped advancing. That's why people went crazy. Indeed. I almost forgot to do something important. What's up? I almost forgot to read uh, the the plot synopsis from a little VHS tape here. Oh, God, yeah. Oh, my God. Let's see. I believe I found the the British tape here. This is from uh, Forefront Video by way of Guild Home Video. They tried to burn him. They tried to bury him. They tried to wash him away with holy water. <laughs> what? <laughs> but like Freddy says, sticks and stones may break my bones, but you can never kill me. And he said it just like that. There's just one problem. He's run out of kids to spook in Springwood. Really? He was spooking people? (laughs) So Freddy hitches a ride inside some poor soul's dream to the nearest town and hey, quicker than you can say 9, 10, never sleep again, the dream stalker's back in business. But enough is enough. Do or die, it's time someone made Freddy hang up his hat for good. So get ready for Freddy in the final nightmare. Cameo appearances by Roseanne Barr, Johnny Depp, and Alice Cooper. And hello, Tom Arnold. What the fuck, man? Yeah, I didn't even spot him until I was... And there's a few, uh, which we'll come to later, uh, yeah, kind of interesting people in this. I'm glad I hadn't finished masturbating when he showed up. (laughs) I'm sorry, what? Hello? (laughs) The tape says, they save the best for last. (laughs) So no question mark after that. (laughs) Did they? Huh? Hmm. All right. So we we open with a, 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 a nightmare on a plane sequence, which I'm like, gee, I wonder why I'm scared to fly now. Fuck. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, even before the, uh, and I love this, just that uh, that woman, you know, famous last words, don't be a pussy before getting, you know, sucked out of the roof. But it's, it's, it's before that, it's the, um, you know, like the water leaking through the window. That, that's like kind of anxiety <laughs> that inducing. That's not enough. good. <laughs> nope. If you're flying in a plane and you see that there's water leaking during a storm, get off that plane as quickly as possible. That's why I applaud <sighs> this young man. Oh, yeah, but this young man, by the way, character's name is John Doe. We never know his real name, but he's played by Sean, S-O-S-H-O-N, Greenblatt. Hmm. Greenblatt. And, uh, ooh, Newsies. Hello. Ooh, he was also in Chopper Chicks in Zombie Town. Wonderful. Yeah, he really didn't do a lot. <laughs> he didn't, and I don't know what you think of his performance. I mean, I wouldn't change a damn thing about it because there's some like kind of line readings and stuff where you're like, was it meant to be that way? Was he trying to be funny? Because there's some <laughs> bits that just like crack me the fuck up. Like, um, oh, I don't know. It might be like later on in the film, but let's just have a quick look. Uh, oh yeah, that. <laughs> and I was watching this again earlier while I was getting like set up. Uh, Free me, you idiot. I'm your fucking memory. Yeah. And then, like, when he wakes up, he knocks that poor guy out of the fucking window. It's just so oh, that it always makes me Oh, laugh. boy. There's a lot going on here with this this screenplay. Like, I think the dialogue is is a big problem here. And maybe maybe some cheesy performances. But, man, I think folks were just like, what? What is my line? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so we got a lot of um falling and falling and falling and, and hilarious falling stuff. Like, this intro is great. This intro is so much fun when he rolls down the hill and then it, it's like this extended joke for like five minutes. Oh, it's so funny. Oh, yeah, they were loving their, uh, and you get a lot of it later on as well, the kind of POV cams and, um, yeah, just kind of just kinetic, just camera, uh, just playing about with it really, which, um, might be before, um, again, you know, they, I think they, kind of felt they got a bit bogged down with the 3d which i'm wondering whether that's why like you know um you know this lead guy why his performance suffers a bit because maybe there was more focusing on i mean there is even a line from one of the um special features where rachel tell is just like a lot of the time you know how do i get um let's just say someone like how do i get the 3d to work so maybe they were more focused on that than uh you know the actors i don't know we get bob shea and another cameo Oh, God, yeah. Again, like, uh, who did we say? 
<laughs> yeah. Gene Simmons or somebody he said he looked like in uh, <laughs> yes. Nightmare 2. Because this, I was looking at him and I was like, my brain having like complete cognitive dissonance going, is this Robert Eng- Englund? No, it, c- it can't be. So yeah, you know, I was blown away to see it was Bob Shea again. It's like, what the fuck? You know, he's actually he a bit loves, of a chameleon. He's sneaking in those movies. Oh yeah. This bus comes and uh, hits him and we get our, our Freddy finally shows up. Now, what do you think of the makeup in this one? I thought it was pretty slick. Like, hmm. the makeup looks pretty much perfect. As in, they show Freddy really close up. This is from my DVD. I don't know how the Blu-ray is. But the DVD, I mean, it just looks great. It just looks super slick. Yeah, no, it's solid. Yeah, no, no problem with it. Um, it was, uh, God, um, what's his name? The late uh, John Carl Buchler again, who I think he was like the head makeup guy on the last film as well. And obviously, you know, he, he flipping uh, knew his stuff, you know, when it came yeah. to uh, crafting these effects and then some. Big time. Man, rest in peace. We just lost mm, him. Mm. Crazy. Our pal John Doe, who's unwittingly going to grab some victims for Freddy and bring them back to good old Springwood. Uh, he ends up at a, at a wayward home that they think he's a junkie because he's taking these no-dose pills. Because even though he has no memory of who he is, he knows he can't go to sleep. And this is where we meet all of our buds. We're going to meet all of our, our fun folks that we're going to hang out with. Uh, first, we got Lisa Zane, who plays Maggie Burroughs, a.k.a. Different name, because she's not Maggie Burroughs. Oh, my God. But uh, this actress is the the older sister of Billy Zane. Oh, really? really? Amazing. Yep. Cool. Yep. She does not have his male pattern baldness that I know of. <laughs> and there's one of two Twin Peaks connections that are going to happen in this discussion today. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And uh, yeah, she was in uh, da, 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 1997 called The Nurse, which is a horror film. What'd you see? Literally below that in her um, uh, filmography, there's a short that says The Nervous Breakdown of Philip K. Dick, where she plays, I think this is one of uh, Dick's wives, uh, Tessa. That's interesting. But The Nurse, oh, what's this? Let's see. Ooh, this looks fun. Pray she's not on call. The (laughs) Nurse, registered to kill. She's the freaking villain, dude. Oh, cool. Oh, we, we gotta track that shit down. Definitely. Yeah, but she's still working. Up until a couple years ago. Maybe she's mm-hmm. retired. Oh my god, she's in Monkey Bone. Shit. <laughs> wow. She played Medusa. Interesting. Uh, but no, I really like this actress a lot. She's going to be our, our final girl, so to speak, here. Yeah, no, she really, um, in a lot of ways, I suppose, kind of carries the film. Yeah. Oh, by the way, she plays a counselor for all these wayward youths. She has something mysterious in her past, which... Uh, our man Yafit Kodo, mm-hmm. holy shit! Wow. So he plays Doc, and he's he's a uh, psychologist slash dream analyzer dude. And Yafit Kodo, man, what a freaking career! Holy shit! Oh yeah. Ninety six credits, freaking Alien, but so many more. Like he's just a fucking awesome actor. He's in Warning Sign, which I really liked. Scared the shit out of me as a kid. Was he in a Bond movie? Am I am I making that up? Ooh, no. Ooh. Uh, the spy who forgot me. Yeah, no yeah, idea. he's live and let die. Yeah, of course. Thank yeah. you, God. Folks at home, I don't know if you know this, but I am the most fucking not James Bond person in the world. So I and I like them, but I don't retain them. I used I went for many years where I was like, I don't like the Bond movies, but I do like them. I just I just don't know shit about them. I, I know what you mean. I'm not crazy about them, um, although there were ones I really like. I, I watched, you know, especially all the older ones on, like, Saturday afternoon as a kid. They used to, like, play one every week. But, um, oh, yeah. yeah, since then, I, I don't remember a lot. So he's he's trying to get her, he's trying to get uh, Maggie to analyze her dreams because he knows he has some issues. But she's like, nah, dog, I'm okay. Uh, we got Leslie Dean who plays Tracy. She kind of steals the movie. Oh, yeah, she's great. Man, I really like this actress. Uh, she stopped working a while ago, but, um, she's in 976 Evil. Uh, she was awesome in Girlfriend from Hell. That movie is fucking wonderful. Really need to rewatch that. That is Doom Show material right there. I was going to say, is that on our list already or if not? It should be. It is now. Yeah. And I've just noticed, oh, she was in an episode of uh, Freddy's Nightmares as well. Cool. Ooh, 
Ooh, nice. Uh, <laughs> she was in Plump Fiction. <laughs> At first, I was just scanning oh, through this, and I was like, looked at it and went, "Oh, uh, she's in." I read it as, "Oh, she's in Pulp Fiction." Jodie struck the gimp, and then, but I didn't kind of go, "Wait, what?" Wait a minute. <laughs> so good old Julie Brown, one of the most unsung comedians in the world. What from flipping Bloody Birthday? Yes, and in Bloody Birthday, I I love her so much. She's so great. Mm, uh, she's just mm. oh, wonderful. But yeah, I actually tried to sit through Plump Fiction on cable one time. It is fucking horrid. It is so <laughs> bad. Oh my lord. But no, I I love Leslie Dean in this movie. She plays um a girl who's recovering from horrible family trauma. Her father molested her, and so she's this tough badass who's will basically kick the fucking shit out of you. Uh, she's mm. she's got lots of issues, but man, it's I really like her performance, even if it is a little uh. <laughs> shrill because i think that's just that's just her style she's really shrill in girlfriend from hell but when you're in girlfriend from hell you gotta you gotta do what you gotta do oh definitely definitely yeah i know what you mean it's like even kind of rewatching it it, it takes me a bit to kind of warm to her again um yeah well even though it, straight away you kind of know you know like you say she's got issues and all that but um yeah you she becomes a bit more rounded as it goes on i guess you might say mm-hmm Ah, uh, we got Ricky Dean Logan, who plays Carlos. He he's another guy who's uh, suffered from his his family trauma. He his mother abused him, and one of her punishments was to clean his ears uh, so violently that she fucking made him deaf in in his ears. Yuck! What an asshole! Oh my God! Mm. I like this actor. What else was he in? I I don't. Well, for a start, I mean, I know you're not a fan of these films, but um, he was apparently in Back to the Future Part 2 and 3. Oh my god. Now in right. 3, it seems like he's part of um, Flea's um, gang. And I'm guessing That's maybe similar so in 2, funny. he's listed as somebody called Data or something. Oh, I'm not sure who that is. Yes. My, my, my love of the Back to the Future movies is, is famous. <laughs> <laughs> he had the starring role in a movie called Psycho Sushi. Mm. Psycho Sushi, 1997. Harper, a young blonde American girl modeling in Japan, has become involved with Hashimoto, a notorious Japanese gangster. She has an affair with the sexy philandering Carlo, one of Hashimoto's hitmen, that ends in Carlo's murder. Harper then flees back to America and writes a tell all book about the Yakuza. Hashimoto soon finds out and comes to America to seek revenge. Mm. What the okay. fuck? Uh, that sounds so yeah. familiar. I don't know why that sounds familiar to me, but what the fuck? <laughs> God, yeah, we never heard of that. Flipping out. Why look at anything else in his freaking uh, career? That's incredible. I was just going to uh, 2005, a film called L.A. Dicks, where he's playing <laughs> himself, maybe? He's playing Ricky Dean? Playing okay. a dick. <laughs> ah, yes. In France, it was just called La Dicks. <laughs> Funny stuff. What are you doing? Shut up! Psycho Sushi. No, I like this guy. He's he's very charming. Uh, but no one's as charming as Brecken Meyer. Oh Holy boy! Shit. How? I this is one of those people that must wake up and like check to see if he still has a career. Like he because he's <laughs> such a ubiquitous like 90s teen movie dude that it's just god bless him he has never stopped 78 credits my mind was absolutely blown when i realized some of the things he'd been in you know like um case in point a film that i watched a lot in the early dvd days and i haven't seen since which was road trip i had no idea he was the same guy in that because he looks yep. totally different you know all his hair anyway god who's in the craft and, um, he was oh, yeah. one of the yeah, we surfers so in Escape from L.A. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> in France, it was called Escape from La. <laughs> <clears throat> he was in Go, which uh, Jeffrey and I recently discussed how we'd never seen. Hmm. Holy shit. He was in the Garfield movies. <laughs> he yes. played John Arbuckle. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> yeah. Oh man, no, you get it. the exact same reaction. It's like, God, but he, he does a lot of stuff with Robot Chicken. So I'm guessing he's still buds with Seth Green. You know, once you're in teen movies together, mm -hmm. you gotta hang forever. Stay together, guys. 
his problem with his family. Everyone has family problems here. Uh, his dad is this overbearing dickweed. He actually refers to his dad as a date rapist. <laughs> like, oh yeah, he wants me to be, uh, you know, just basically be him. But uh, oh yeah, frankly, I don't feel like playing football and date raping co-eds. It's like, oh man, your dad has been uh, sharing a bit too much information there about his uh, about his college days. Uh, so the the three of them are in this 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 home for for uh, for children who have issues, and uh, they're all trying to escape. One of them keeps making pipe bombs, apparently, which is sure. And then, uh, the, so the three of them, that's uh, Tracy, Carlos, and Spencer, they decide to sneak out. And their brilliant plan is to hide in the garbage in the back of the van. So this halfway <laughs> home has this trashed, disgusting van. So Lisa Zane, uh, Maggie, she's going to take good old John Doe back to Springwood because he has an article an article that has a 3D feature on it that's going to uh, foreshadow the 3D later. She and John Doe have the same dream about a little girl who's being chased around a yard and something scary happens. So she's like, okay, so this article's from Springwood. Let's go to Springwood. So they're going to Springwood. Uh, he almost wrecks the car because he keeps falling asleep and dreaming. Hilarity. Trying to kill her. And then that's when they discover the three... I, there's almost good time Charlies if they weren't so damaged. <laughs> that that they find them hiding in the back of the van, and so they all go to Springwood, playing right into Freddy's dastardly plan. Uh, but I don't want to skip the scene where uh, the frickin', like you mentioned before, the, the, the awesome line reading, I'm your fucking memory, dude. <laughs> that whole sequence is so fucking silly. It sets up jokes. There's, like, jokes coming, especially in uh, mm. John Doe's final dream. It's really fun. God, I'm really losing it. I don't know what happened there. Blech. Oh, don't worry. Let's fast forward to them going to Springwood. So <laughs> they go to Springwood, the three stowaways, John Doe and Maggie, and they go right to a crazy carnival where uh, the, the the broken people, all the parents of Springwood have gone insane. And I wrote in my notes, Children of Men is a hilarious movie. <laughs> Because I hate children, and I still think Children of Men is just a fantasy. Hmm. Like, um, imagine if children stop being born, dude. How great would that be? Yeah. Oh, like the human race would finally be on its way out. There'd be no children. And, like, as an added bonus, there'd be no children. We can hope. Yep. Um, I know I'm never going to be born again. <laughs> so, Roseanne Barr and Tom Arnold play Parents. Uh, which immediately makes you imagine them having sex again, as we all did in the 90s. Uh, someone says something that made me go, oh, Simon. Someone says, <laughs> they take one look at this town and goes, are we in Twin Peaks here? <laughs> <laughs> Relevant. Yeah, they, oh, definitely. I mean, they even, I watched the uh, uh, theatrical trailer before and they even, you know, just trying to cash in, I suppose. They even use that in the trailer. Oh my God, that's awesome. And it apparently being 1999, so in this universe, are we to guess that people didn't get completely burnt out on Twin Peaks and start hating it in 1991 and hear that maybe, you know, they were still making it, you know? One thing this movie does is they try to pander a lot. So like, hey, you've heard of this, right? Hey, video games. Whoa. Hey. All right. Grunge music. Whoa. Heavy metal. All right. Rap music. What? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, and I forgot to mention that that was Chub Rock when she's... <laughs> when uh, Leslie's boxing later, they're playing freaking Chub Rock. And I was like, shit, <laughs> man, she she's Chub rocking it. Chub. So let's see. Uh, I'm doing a cast and crew uh, comparison here of Twin Peaks and Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare. Go for it. Uh, someone from the art department mm -hmm. named Joe Del Monte. Uh, one of the stunt people named Bridget K. Shear and an actor, I think. Dan Neese. Oh, no, wait. I'm sorry. He was a camera operator. So, yeah. So, three crew members. <laughs> Twin Peaks. Uh, doesn't this also have a crybaby freaking connection? Yeah, it does. Because uh, Rachel Talalay, she was... I want to say, was she... Uh, yeah, she was a producer on Crybaby, which she'd made uh, before going on to direct this. And nice. apparently they reused pretty much all the same crew. And it's kind of my theory that... Um, that's how, you know, Aggie Pop ended up doing the, the song at the end and probably how it got to do uh, Johnny Depp to do the cameo as well, I would imagine. Oh, my God. Yep. There is 11 people in common between the two things. That's freaking great. Ah. 
Love it. I'm a big fan of Crybaby. That movie's fucking wonderful. I only saw it once, uh, and I did like it. I think I did it as a double feature with, I want to say, Wild at Heart, maybe. Dude, you are in for a treat. Mm. It is so great. Uh, speaking of Twin Peaksy weird shit, um, I love this town, this broken town. There's a statue of a, of a Boy Scout. Oh, yeah. And uh, <laughs> the, the inscription at the bottom of the statue says, The children shall endure, mm. which uh, I think has... You know, a double meaning. It's got the, the, the meaning of, like, this town could rebuild. I mean, they won't. But, you know, this town could rebuild and maybe the, ch- the children will survive this. But it also is, like, about the children who are our main characters who were abused sexually or, or, or beaten horribly by their parents. So these children shall endure. So it's yeah. kind of a message of hope there embedded in this movie. That's true, yeah. Yeah, and I love how, uh, and I hadn't realized until rewatching it last night that um, there's kind of a callback to uh, Nightmare 4 here, you know, when they end up trapped in the loop. Dude, the loop in this. Thanks for catching that. I almost forgot to mention that. So they're, they're, they're driving, they're trying to get out of the town and uh, they get stuck in this loop and they keep coming back to the same street. And so they decide to switch drivers, mm. which is, is hilarious to me. Um, and it has, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase this line because I did not write this whole line down properly, but there's a great argument. They're like, we were going nowhere. And it's like, yeah, but I got us there in half the time. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I was like, I mean, that's totally paraphrasing, but what a brilliant fucking thing to say. Touche. <laughs> and that's right after the, the map scene where uh, Carlos is <laughs> unfolding the map and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And next thing you know, he's trapped in this maze of a map <laughs> and he gets to the the part that just says, you're fucked. <laughs> and he wakes up and like, well, what does the map say? And the map says we're fucked. Oh, it's, it's perfect. so good. There's some great one-liners in this, man. Absolutely, yeah. They get separated while... Um, Maggie and John Doe are running around researching. They should just go to the microfilm room. I don't know what the fuck they're doing. Just go to the local library, bro. <laughs> and then uh, they get separated and they end up at a house where they're going to crash. And of course, the house explodes and it turns out to be dun 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 Freddy Krueger's house, or rather, uh, Nancy's house. The house from the fucking the other five movies we've been talking about. <laughs> And uh, I have to ask you, man, what the fuck is in Spencer's weed? Yeah, this is um, one of those films where, God, I mean, there's a lot of films that do this, but say off the top of my head, like um, for a few dollars more, where you kind of wonder if the people who put this in as a plot device have ever smoked weed in their lives. Um, Dude, yes. Either that or it's been like, <laughs> it's been dipped in LSD or something. I, I don't know what PCP, LSD, crystal meth. I mean, he starts seeing the shit that isn't there, like... He's staring oh, at the yeah. broken TV he said, man, look what's on TV, man. And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Super drugs. What's on TV, of course, is is freaking Johnny Depp. But we'll get to that in a moment. We get to see uh, Carlos not successfully confronting his father. Mm. I mean, his father, excuse me, his mother yeah. who, oh, who yeah, freaking yeah, yeah. just shoves that Q-tip in. Mm-hmm. And as, as sad as the line is, it really is corny. It was like, please don't make me deaf, mama. It's like, oh, my God. It's like. I, I think that's that's good that these move this movie like really confronts abuse and really talks about it. It's mm. just you know it's it's that dichotomy of oh popcorn movie serious issue so you're a little weird but yeah, it never gets yeah. exploitive. It just gets you know makes you think wooly. It's a, a bit kind of like tonally obviously like kind of <laughs> what the fuck are we actually going for it? But it's nothing that like yeah. yeah derails the movie and you kind of go God what were you thinking? What's really funny is I remember the scene with uh, Tracy when she confronts her father in the dream. I re- I, oh, yeah. I knew that was coming in the series, but I thought it was in four or five. I did not remember at all that it was in this Interesting. movie. She beats his mm. ass. I have never seen a more satisfying beatdown. It's that her dad comes in. He's being creepy. She hits him with the fucking the percolator, the coffee percolator, <laughs> then wraps the fucking cord around her wrist and starts beating him to death with it. Fuck yeah. Oh, yeah. Dude. That's great. Oh, the only way that could have been better is if she'd like set his freaking crotch on fire first <laughs> and then beat him Indeed. to death yeah, after no. that. But it, man. It is. It is very, very satisfying. And I had a complete holy shit moment while I was watching this yesterday when I realized who... Uh, who the guy playing uh, her daddy is. Um, oh, do tell. I, yeah, it's a guy called um, Peter Spellos, 
who, and I don't know whether you've seen this or not, uh, I know him best for, and he, he's crazy actually looking at his IMDb. The main thing I know him for, uh, is, I think the year before this, was uh, as somebody called Orville Ketchum in uh, Sorority House Massacre 2. Holy shit. Yeah. Dude. And look, but look below that, yeah, you probably have just what seen like fuck? all his anime, cr- anime okay, credits okay. as well. This is why his freaking credits are so many. This was a voice actor. Yeah. Holy yeah. shit. So he did voice acting in Castle of Cagliostro, Mobile Suit Gundam, Fist of the North Star, freaking Akira. Oh my god, dude. Thank you for catching this. Holy shit. Oh, yeah. What a yeah, cool Like I said, dude. just, you know, the uh, sorority house masker stuff a lot. Uh, aside, yeah, when I've just been scrolling through this, it's like, what the fuck? Dude, I am loving this guy. But he also, you know, was kind of a fixture in freaking mm. Hollywood doing all kinds of weird shit. Like Vice Girls. Awesome. So much anime. Yeah, Cowboy Bebop and all Metropolis. Jeez, it <gasps> just goes on and flipping on. Wow. Nerding out on the freaking Doom show. <laughs> <laughs> I like that uh, Rachel Talalay, you know, I th- I think, I'm guessing that she brought some of this to the freaking, to the screenplay, because hmm. she, she, you know, she came up with the, according to IMDb, she came up with the story, but, you know, hats yeah, off for them yeah. leaving it in, like, it's, oh, it's so good. Yeah, I'm absolutely. glad they didn't, like, shy away from this, this storyline. Well, there was uh, something in the, uh, and again, this is off IMDb, so, you know, take it with a pinch of salt, but um, apparently, and again, sorry, I'm terrible at keeping names in my head, let's see. Uh, yeah, Leslie Dean. Yeah, she said apparently this kind of triggered some potential repressed memories of some potential, you know, real life molestation. Oh, my um, God. It didn't really say any more than that, but that's, yeah, just kind of, again, adds this extra edge, wow. which is maybe, I mean, she has a lot of, you know, if you're sort of alluding to a lot of attitude to begin with, but yeah, just that, like you say, the beat down, it really feels like, you know, she's, there's some real kind of fire behind that, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, one of the things that's mm. really mm. haunting with, with the, the child abuse, like, uh, stuff in mind is this phrase over and over again of, I won't tell, mm. where... Mm. You know, we see young Freddy uh, before he get burnt before he got burned by the people. His wife has discovered, you know, Mrs. Kruger has discovered what he's been doing, and she's I won't tell. And mm. then he, she gets murdered horrifically, and uh, of course now her the daughter Maggie, although she was Catherine Kruger by birth, she is also saying I won't tell, and it's like ooh, it's just some creepy. Yeah, especially because, you know, like how it's framed when you see him, like, kind of bashing her head against something. Like, you can see the little girl in shot, and then you have the, you know, a reaction. And she looks genuinely <laughs> fucking just, just like, <sighs> you know, God, I can't even, you know. It's like, just what did they tell her to it. get her into that state, dude? <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Oh, it just looks God. so genuine. It's like, what were you doing? I love it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my favorite joke in the movie is when uh, John Doe wakes up again in his dream and he, he's always in the same bedroom where he wakes up and he's like, nothing is going to make me get out of this bed. And then the bed fucking catches on fire. It is so funny. That got such a big <laughs> laugh for me every time. And there's some there's some genuinely like laugh out loud jokes in this movie. And that's the best. one. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The final 10 minutes of Freddy's Dead have been painstakingly shot in a special 3D process, which the filmmakers call Freddy Vision. This roller coaster ride takes the main characters deep into Freddy's twisted memories to reveal the true identity of his only child, and then to plunge Freddy into his own worst nightmare. There's references to to the first film, and you know there's little like nods to to where things are going here. Uh, and of course, the biggest nod to the first film is their bright idea is to pull Freddy out of the dream and kill him. Again, there's this wonderful fight sequence that's so corny and over the top. Uh, this is after we have to put on our 3D glasses, <laughs> which uh, because the the 3D process was so expensive, they didn't do the entire movie in 3D. They just did one sequence in 3D. And uh, mm, I, mm. I do you you have the Blu-ray right? Yeah, there's um, there's no like 3D glasses with it or anything. It, ah. said, it said somewhere that the DVD set had them. No, Is that right? My oh. DVD set did not. Oh. So I have like the I, but dude, I think we've talked about this before. 
I have the budget, the lowest budget nightmare set. Right. Because so far I'm six for six in this mm-hmm. set. Not a single extra on any disc. No audio commentaries. Maybe a trailer. And that's it. Maybe subtitles. <laughs> <laughs> Those are my extras. Mm-hmm. So I'm really like, uh, it just drives me fucking crazy. So I don't know if, if, if Blu-rays have anything. I'm presuming they do. I need to upgrade this shit just for the video quality, you know. They, mm-hmm. um, it varies. Some have more than others. I think like one maybe has more and carries over, you know, as a, yeah. some more like, you know, the rest of them, it's just like t- two minute like featurettes and stuff. Oh, um, I love sometimes. That. Oh no, that you know, some of it's very interesting, but I think it's only really with one. I think one has maybe a director and maybe cast commentary and maybe some longer features, but it's it's really crying out for a more kind of um, deluxe set, really. Although I know you know a lot of the I suppose supplementary material you would have now, you would get really just by getting that um, Never Sleep Again documentary, really. Exactly. So I can't complain too much, but I will anyway. So they drag Freddy out of the dream world, and uh, there's this hilarious thing about these dream demons. That uh, I think al- <laughs> alluding to them was fine. The execution of how they look is fucking horrid. Mm. And it's not just dated. They always have looked horrid. They they kill Freddy by dragging him in and then shoving a pipe bomb in his stomach and blowing him up. And then we have this amazing computer-generated moment. Freddy's head flying, his, head, his mouth opens, another head flies out, and then... <laughs> and then Freddy explodes into pixels, and then the stupid fucking dream demons are flying around because, of course, 3D. <sighs> Man, uh, other than the hilarious knife throwing where they pin Freddy Krueger to the wall, and then, of course, mm. they, they throw a freaking Chinese star at his groin, which I really appreciated. <laughs> but yeah, dude, what did you have anything else to add from this, this plot, this fucking batshit crazy shit well, that's happening? <sighs> Yeah, just about this kind of end sequence, and again, sort of tying to the um, behind the scenes stuff. Yeah, like I said, it was a real, I think, source of frustration that they were, they were kind of, it was kind of forced on them. And I'm not really sure why, because aside from this, I don't really know of any other films that were in 3D around this era. Mm. So yeah, you know, with, if they hadn't had to do that, they would have, you know, like, God, you just think back to, um, well, all of them, but, you know, like through two and three and like four, I think, especially I'm trying to remember is Demise in five, but they're all pretty spectacular effect sequences. And it would have been great if they could have, you know, put more into that as I think they would have wanted to if they didn't have to go this way and really go all out, you know, for his, uh, you know, supposed final demise. But no, not to be. And yeah, you just left with and it is it's that age of like really early computer graphics. It just looks Kind of, if you beat wanting to be kind, kind of uh, in heavy quotes, interesting now, but really, if we're being honest, like you say, pretty fucking horrible. So I'm looking at, I'm trying to find 3D movies, and mm. yeah, dude, it, shit really freaking dropped off. Like 3D was like completely fucking dead. Yeah. Uh, yeah. IMDb's completely failed me, but. Uh, I'm looking on Wikipedia, so. And a lot of these are things that I remember seeing at, like, Universal and Disney when I went over there of, like, you know, Honey, I Shrunk the Audience, Muppet Vision 3D, Terminator oh, 2 boy. 3D. Oh, Alfred Hitchcock art making movies. Yeah, pretty much all of these I remember from, like, those theme parks. What the hell? Yeah. Sodoma, what yep. got theme to. parks. It was, it was relegated to theme parks. Wow. So, yeah, this is hilarious. <laughs> Honey, I Shrunk the Audience. Blah. <laughs> and of course, by the 2000s, we'd be inundated with 3D again, and nobody would oh, care. Christ. Yeah. It was all garbage. The only time I really um, had a great time with 3D was uh, Coraline. Oh, so you, did you see that in a theater in 3D? I, take I it. sure did, man. Oh, wow, man. I, I wish I... Th- I discovered that on, um, I think, on one of our uh, like um, TV movie channels or something. And uh, you only recently, for the first time in years, rewatched it. It was like, why am I not watching this more often, you know? Dude, that's it's freaking great. Right. Something special, yeah. Golden, yeah, definitely. Oh, did we talk? We talked a little bit about the um, oh the Johnny Depp and the whole yeah, let's trip out scene and uh, and all that. So yeah, like you say, you know, to begin with, God only knows what he's been smoking. Yeah, first he's watching it looks like you know like Dawn of the Dead or something on TV, and Carlos appears. 
uh, you know, to like, you know, wake up you stoner, you know, and the rest of it. Yeah. And no, all that oh disappears. God. And yeah, we get uh, this Johnny Depp cameo, which is, I guess, so this was, was this like a um, contemporary, I'd, I'd heard it referenced, I think, by Bill Hicks before, um, you know, this, the whole, this is your brain thing. Oh, yes. I'm guessing that was like a 90s, like PSA or what have you. It was very wonderful. Drugs were mm. scary. <laughs> Yeah, I've seen uh, God. Was it in uh, Nightmare Two? Maybe recently. I was showing a friend where there's. I think it's in the the gym teacher's office as a. Uh, and I saw it in another movie the same day. Actually, I think probably from the same year. That just said like, well, it says more, but the thing that stood out is pot hurts. <laughs> yes, it does. Ouch. But yeah, there's there's but, a very uh, obvious dare. To keep kids off drugs sticker in this movie. It's like freaking huge. Mm. What, a, mm. what a wonderful, wonderful freaking campaign. And uh, rightfully, yeah, Freddy just totally takes the piss out of it. You know, it's like, I don't know what he says, but you know. All right, once again, this is your brain. This is your brain on drugs. Questions? Yeah! What are you on? Looks like a frying pan and some eggs to me. <laughs> so stupid. And, um, oh God, yeah. And then, uh, yeah, he, he, Freddy chucks the old uh, iron butterfly on. And, yeah, the uh, old psychedelia <laughs> sequence <laughs> starts. <laughs> Which, again, is very, like, uh, very, very 1991. You know, it's, it's almost like a drug bit out of, like, the fucking Simpsons or something. I can't think how to describe it. <laughs> I feel um, like if they got stoned and, and yeah, Roger goes into Rabbit. this whole uh, video game. Uh, old Roger Rabbit as well, yeah. yeah. So it's, that, it's that point again, isn't it, where the, the kind of 80s is kind of bleeding into the 90s, you know. So yeah, he gets pulled into a fucking platform game. And we have, um, yeah, they're taking the piss out of him. This made me laugh in the... <laughs> One of the bits of IMDb trivia is, yeah, apparently they, they didn't get permission off Nintendo to take the piss out of the Power Glove. It's like, oh, you don't say. Now you're playing with power. And that's funny so, enough. I love especially when they got Breck and Meyer around the, around the house just bow, boinging up and down. It's just that cracks me up every time. It's imaginative, that's for sure. Oh, yeah, definitely. It's fun. It's fun, yeah. Oh, what else around this bit? Um, oh, and just again, speaking of, uh, what was his name again? The the main guy playing John Doe. Sean, Sean Greenblatt, his just completely nonplussed reaction when uh, Breck and Mike was flying through the window. It's like, oh, yeah, I found Spencer. I'm like, oh, right, okay. That is such a great joke. Oh, it's so oh. funny. It's like, buddy, yeah, buddy, are you not on drugs as well? I suppose he's very sleep deprived, to be fair. <laughs> uh, we mentioned him briefly earlier, and I was looking at the VHS tape, but uh, freaking Alice Cooper, mm. man. Oh, yeah, Love yeah. Alice mm. Cooper showing up in this shit. Oh, man. Yeah. Love him. Ready? Ready for it, boy? You've been away since the day I took you in. Now it's time to take your medicine. I'm going to go ahead and just start off my little... Where I first encountered this film, if it's all right with you. Yeah, go for it. I actually saw this in the theater. I was a huge Freddy fan. And so I was Mm. about 15 when this came out. One Saturday, my mom bought the ticket for me. Because, of course, this is an R-rated movie. Mm. And so I... Went to the theater and I, I saw it with a fairly decent crowd, if I can remember correctly, and got to watch mm. it with the uh, 3D glasses for the 3D sequence and everything. And yeah. uh, I loved this movie as a kid. This uh, nostalgia has been carrying this movie along in my estimation for a long time. So it was really shocking when I found out that people didn't like this movie. I was like, what? Are you fucking crazy? Uh, mm. Analyzing it for this discussion, though. Uh, I could see why people don't like this one. Lots of pandering, like I said, with the plot, with the mm-hmm. video games. Mm-hmm. It's a very gimmicky movie. Uh, I don't like the score at all. I really don't like the song choices at all. It's a little cornball, but what I love about this movie is the message, the anti-abuse uh, message is just embedded in this thing and mm. maybe like confronting people who who you know confronting abusers maybe not beating them to death so much as mm. confronting mm. The, the horrors of your past and rising above them uh this feels like you were saying a very 80s movie i think this is the greatest 80s freddy movie they forgot to make in the 80s the, the greatest was sorry 
the greatest uh, 80s movie Sorry. they forgot to make in the 80s. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm with you. Sorry, again, this, oh, you know, this delay has been driving me crazy. So we're just, yeah, we've <laughs> been have to do folks at home. Skype has been so good to us for the entire time that Simon and I have been recording this show until today. So, so in case we're a little disjointed, it's because skype is and you know controlled. it's funny that we say that this is kind of very meta just during what you just said i caught like just fragments of it because that was probably the most broken sentence i've heard in the last couple of hours <laughs> of the recording what the fuck? well simon if you can hear me <laughs> uh I how do you like this one like, what did you think of this film does it does well, it make you happy yeah, for- it does. Yeah, I've, you know, I've had it on, I keep forgetting because I can't really see the TV where I'm sat at the desk, but I've had for a change because I know other people on podcasts do this sometimes. I've had the movie on in the background and, it's, and we're just in the credits now. Uh, and I love, um, before getting into kind of, you know, the generalities of it, I love the, uh, the open, the, the ending montage we have, you know, after yes. you know, Freddy's dead and all that. It's such a kind of great little kind of almost celebration, you know, sort of kind of love letter to the series, uh, you know, along with that cool little, uh, Iggy Pops song it's just it's a great fun way to to end that because this really is and it's funny what you said about you know the um if i if i kind of heard you right you know about it being kind of almost like a um, movie they forgot to make in the 80s it really is the end of an era in that sense and that kind of you know nicely caps it off but sort of going back again before i forget what you're saying about the kind of whole abuse stuff just how yeah, there's there's some bits where, like you're saying with Tracy and again, you know, with you know Maggie and uh, Freddie as well, there, there's kind of a a bit of an edge to some of it where it, it feels like you know they are being you know those bits they're not camp, they are kind of being respectful to the fact you know this is real stuff people uh, have to deal with. And uh, there was something that I don't know if it struck me before, but it did watching yesterday where there's a moment where Freddie becomes kind of almost sympathetic for a moment, you know, before it's kind yeah. of like almost. And I'm not sure how serious he is because you wonder. Like, like with the backstory of like you know aside from still being a flipping serial killer and all that you know while he's married and you know has a kid and all that it, it seems almost like you could take seriously what he's saying of like oh I you know I really tried to make a go of it and that once his child is presumably taken away from him that, that 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 would provide a great motivation for him you know killing off these children so maybe if they'd gone more with that and maybe restructured it a bit that could have had a bit maybe more potency with it you know it works for what it is you know I suppose but um. Yeah, overall, you know, some, uh, say, tonal confusion on this aside. I, I generally really love this one. You know, it's, um, well, like I say, I, I enjoyed this one from the first watch and it's not really, it hasn't really lost anything and it's maybe gained a bit, you know, not, not like massively or exponentially, but, um, yeah, just steadily, you know, over the what, half dozen times I've maybe watched it. Nice. <laughs> God knows why. Like I say, they decided to do the last 10 minutes in 3D. So that seems in some way soaking the half ass. It's like, why do you even bother? But I, I really like the way it's kind of integrated into the plot. You know, is this... the uh, And oh, this was another kind of very tenuous Twin Peaks connection. You know, having a psychiatrist who has, kind of has 3D glasses. You know, like our pal uh, Dr. Jacoby. But um, yeah, you know, how he... <laughs> and it, I suppose this would work, you know, in a way if you were kind of into like lucid dreaming. You know, if you... um. You, you took this kind of totem or object, which like it says in the real world, it's kind of meaningless, but it has this kind of power in the dream world, which it, it does. So that, that's kind of, um, kind of neat, I guess. Um, yeah, I watched the special features and I, um, there's some interesting stuff from uh, online as well. So Rachel Teller, she wrote the story outline, you know, in mind with they were going to kill Freddy off. And she, um, wanted it to kind of be less gothic, I suppose, and more fun than five and wanted kind of more backstory as well. Right. And, um, yeah, unsurprisingly, mentions Twin Peaks and says here and Michael DeLuca you know like a lot of people were kind of in love with it at the time and not just that but saying Carnival of Souls was apparently an influence as well which I've, it's a while Ooh. since I've seen that so I'm not entirely sure where that kind of comes off apart from um, just general kind of weird ambience I'm not sure but like we were saying you know, she'd just come off Crybaby and figured you know there's a lot of crazy cameos in that that they could they could do the same which obviously they did and yeah, I thought that was kind of a good bit, how she, um, you know, they go into Freddy's head and through his kind of backstory at the end. But there was a sense, and Robbie Shea sort of alluded to this, that they were kind of running out of ideas a bit and kind of trying to stretch things. So it was a good time to kind of, as he says, uh, leave Freddy alone for a few years. Yeah, I'd forgot about this. Apparently, um, you saw this, Peter Jackson wrote the original screenplay. And it what? says, uh, yeah, would have seen 
Yeah, yeah, apparently. Uh, and again, this is off IMDb here. I think it was on Wikipedia as well, so take it all with a pinch of salt. Uh, yeah, it said, um, would have seen Freddy aging and growing weak within the dream world, and the teams of Springwood would have drug fueled slumber parties for kicks and enter the dream world to beat him up. Oh, man, that would have been awesome. <laughs> yeah. And there's uh, there's more as well. Um, oh, there was another original script apparently written. Who's this guy? Michael Almereda. Sorry if I'm butchering this name. That rings a bell. What the hell else did he write? Oh, he just directed a bunch of stuff. But but anyway, it says apparently he'd written an original script for it where you'd have had a 16-year-old Jacob Johnson, who was obviously uh, Alice's son. As Alice, now in her 30s, was killed by Freddy. Taryn, Joey, and Kincaid from uh, 3 returned as the Dream Police. Taryn was the Blade Cop, Joey was the Sound Cop, and Kincaid was the Power Cop. Unsurprisingly, uh, people really didn't like this, and so Michael DeLuca Weird. kind of sort of sa- saved the day with his script. Yeah, what the fuck? So, yeah, interesting kind of genesis of the story. So it sounded like it worked out pretty well in the end. I like how, you know, early on they have, you know... Um, See young Maggie and the sort of the dreams merging and coming together to sort of pull all these characters together. I think that works quite well, sort of uh, structurally. You have to wonder what how the movie would have been different had they taken the budget for the 3D stuff, abandoned mm. it, and then just put it towards like more like production design or something. That mm. would have been interesting too. Exactly. But hey, the movie. Yeah. The movie yeah. is how the movie turned out. But I'm loving all of those freaking ideas. Are wonderful. <laughs> Even like the Peter Jackson one yeah, and the other dudes yeah. thing. That sounds great. Oh yeah. Again, you know, it's, you could visit the universes where those were made. It would have been interesting to see them. Hey, uh, they made Edward penis hands. So why not this stuff? <laughs> and that final line: the the Freddy's dead. And then boom, yeah, oh yeah. So, I re- I really am glad that we're doing this. It's it's interesting. Mm. We're capping off because for some reason I, I'm coming around to it. I'm really excited to cover it with you next time, which is New Nightmare. I'm I'm really excited to kind of rewatch it because I always dogged that movie because I didn't like it in the theater and I really didn't like revisiting it later. But I'm hoping mm. that after th- this viewing, this will be the one. Because this has always been the cap. This is where the Freddy movies ended for me for a long time. Mm. Um, I, I mean, I, I can't wait to talk about the freaking <laughs> Freddy versus Jason with you and the freaking remake oh next yeah. time. That's going to be a, a discussion and a half right there. But yeah, mm. this this is kind of interesting that we're at this. I mean, I'm sure people thought uh, that the final chapter of Friday the Thirteenth it was over, man. <laughs> You you can't keep a good dream demon out of your pants. <laughs> and, and why would you want to? So, folks, since, since Simon and I have, have broken Skype, we apologize to anyone else trying to use Skype right now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think we've done that. Folks, thank you for going on this journey with us. This is fucking nuts. I'm, I'm glad we didn't try to do all of these <laughs> in one 50-hour episode. Oh, that would have been bad. But And, Simon, thank you for joining me, sir. Oh, most welcome. And again, sorry, you know, folks, for, uh, you know, again, if any of this comes across a bit weird, disconnected, or kind of staccato, but fucking Skype today, I cannot even. It's because we're dreaming, dude. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> In a god of the feet of honor, don't you know I'm pooping too? You know, that's what I missed, actually. I think I should have done, and that might have helped with the delay if I'd smoked before this. <laughs> the gaps would have been like two hours between every sentence so no oh christ yeah (laughs) bye folks good night hello this is the doom show is a proud member of the legion podcast network please check out the other shows at legionpodcasts.com if you want more of hello this is the doom show check out doomedmoviethon.com or Hello Doomed Show. Podomatic.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at Doomed Movieathon or email the show Doomed Movieathon at gmail.com. We're also in the air. Look up. If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcasts, 
Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th Get Slayed, The Hell Ming Power Hour, Hello This Is The Doom Show, Hero Hero Go Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Mental Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick Six Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Witch vs. The Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found.